And we are live. Hey, everybody. This is Roberto Blake helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to talk about how to be a full-time content creator. I've actually been doing this for quite a long time. For those of you who remember and are familiar, and I'm a content creator that's actually doing multiple six figures a year. New creator economy report from Kajabi just came out. Interesting stat. Also, shout out to Kajabi as one of our sponsors. So interesting stat, less than 5% of content creators make over $100,000 a year. Now you can be a full-time content creator without making $100,000 a year, but if you do happen to make that amount, which I hope many of you do or are on the way to, that's part of my mission is to get you there, uh, you would be in the top 5%. If you make multiple six figures a year, you're in the top 1% of all the creators in the creator economy. So really cool stat from the creator economy report from our friends over at Kajabi. So today I'm gonna to be doing everything in my power to answer your questions and to kind of give you some helpful tips and a framework for becoming a full-time content creator. And if you are watching this live, we need to help more creators. So share the live stream out to the community wherever you can. Let's get those numbers up. Let's get more people in here. And if you're watching the replay, we are going to have timestamps for you. You're gonna to wanna to share this in your other creator community so that more people can learn. We're gonna be talking about the things you need to know and break down the different monetization and revenue streams of full-time content creators. There are primarily six of these, but you can actually break out those six into subcategories, and we will cover a lot of that because it's not just YouTube AdSense. It's actually creator, um, you know, funds as well. And it's things like it's platform revenue and you can break platform revenue out into things like the YouTube partner program, YouTube premium, for example. And so there's multiple layers to platform revenue. There's obviously donations and fan funding. And also you have memberships. You have the ability to split memberships between, oh, platform revenue, or maybe I use something else for memberships. Maybe you build your own platform on Kajabi. Maybe you do it on Patreon. Maybe you do it in some other way. Products, products could be digital products, could be courses, could be uh, digital downloads, could be merchandise, print on demand. There's a lot of ways to do. So we're gonna break down these different income streams, diversifying your revenue. It's probably the most straightforward way to become a full-time content creator. We're gonna talk about the things you need to know if you leave your nine to five job to be a content creator so that you know how to deal with insurance for your healthcare stuff so that you know how to deal with that. We're gonna talk a little bit about paying yourself and just other things that you may want to know that take you from the nine to five where they're, you know, providing that healthcare coverage, they are providing you your retirement stuff. You know, it's, it's so weird that you end up making either your job or the government protect provision and provide for you as a grown adult. But if we become self-employed, we can do all those things ourselves. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about the numbers that you need to start hitting it's obvious, it's weirdly, it's not really about subscriber count and views unless you make it about subscriber count and views to be a full-time content creator. So we're gonna break that all down for you uh, throughout the stream here. But a quick shout out to our sponsors. <laughs> We've got a couple of them here. Right now, we're actually simulcasting to multiple platforms where we need you to share this out on StreamYard. Right now, I'm streaming on YouTube Live. I'm streaming on Facebook Live. I'm streaming on LinkedIn Live. I'm streaming on Twitch. And I'm also streaming on x.com, formerly Twitter. Soon, we're gonna have the ability to actually live stream with StreamYard to Instagram Live as well and have it do that in portrait mode while we live stream here in landscape mode. Pretty amazing stuff. And you can do that with StreamYard. If you want to check them out, there should be a link in the description down below. If not, I'm gonna make sure that we have that for our friends and wonderful sponsors over at StreamYard. So we are multi-streaming here. Another thing that we're doing is we're gonna be taking the uh, clips from the stream by using Opus Clip, we're gonna run that directly through Opus Clip, and it's gonna do all of our captioning for us to make those really cool Mr. B style, Alex Hermosi style uh, captions. And it's gonna clip the best parts of the stream with AI, and then I'm gonna be able to schedule those to go out to Instagram and LinkedIn and to my highlights channel for YouTube Shorts. 
And so we're going to be able to basically repurpose this at scale, and we're going to be able to upload multiple clips, multiple times a day scheduled across the platforms. So that's actually really cool. So shout out to our good friends at Opus Clip for being another one of our channel sponsors. And then finally, when we talk about uh, the creator economy of report that Kajabi did, and we also talk about making six figures here. One of the reasons I make six figures is because I not only do YouTube, but I make multiple streams of income. And one of them is by having my own website and my own membership platform with Kajabi. With YouTube, we love YouTube memberships. We love YouTube live donations with Super Chats. You know the problem is? We split that 70-30 with YouTube. Wouldn't you like to keep it all? Wouldn't we all like to keep it all? Well, when I pay for Kajabi up front, I get to keep everything I make and my cost doesn't change. So that's the difference. If I make 100000 with YouTube in memberships, then YouTube gets $30,000 and I would get $70,000. With Kajabi, I just pay my fees for the year. In my case, I think it ends up being about maybe $2,000 in fees for the year. And that means when I make over $100,000 with Kajabi, I keep the other $98,000. So you know, that's how we do it. So Kajabi is one of our sponsors. If you want to build an online business for cohorts, you want to do coaching with people one-on-one, -on -one, you want to sell templates. Some of you are selling templates and doing stuff. Um, very cool. You want to do a, a, co a group membership and community. You can have your membership website, your cohorts, your coaching, and your online courses all in one with Kajabi, even built in email marketing. Links to all of these are now live in the description. So thank you to our friends at Kajabi, Opus Clip, and StreamYard. And now the sponsor plugs are taken care of and we can dive right into your questions. If you're doing questions in the live chat, put a Q in front of your questions. And that means I'll be able to highlight them and answer them. We'll obviously automatically through StreamYard have highlighted super chats. Let's say what's up to some of the channel members out here and we'll pop your questions up on the stream. Um, if any of you are trying to get the 12-week creator playbook, when you sign up for it in email, check your spam. Sometimes it goes to spam, especially if you have a Google account. If you have a Google account, it might be going to spam. I'm gonna set up an automation to try to make sure it gets to you anyway, it, but when you wanna download our free 12-week creator playbook, it's a PDF that you guys get, it's linked in the description, if you want the 12-week creator playbook, I'm going to drop it here in the chat. If you're having problems with that download, let me know and DM me, and I'll try and see what I can do. But beyond that, check your spam. It might be going to your spam. If you're in Google, it might be going to the promotions tab in your Gmail if you're using Gmail. But make sure you're signing up for the 12-week free playbook. If you're having problems with it, let me know. Let's see. We got our first question here. This one is from Fixed Point. I'm going to, by the way, get through all the things I queued up at the top of the hour, but I do want to answer some of the questions when they do come in, so we'll be doing that. So we've got Fixed Point here with a question. Hey, Roberto, most of my income comes from brand deals. Is that typical for full-time YouTubers? I have services, products, affiliates on my channel, but most of my income comes from brand deals. Okay, so this is a great question. Uh, most of mine comes from brand deals right now, too. Mine's a little bit more even keel, or at least it was in 2023 20, uh, and before that, to where you know brand deals was kind of competing with what I do at Awesome Creator Academy. And then if you take affiliates and you took a YouTube partner program, it would start to even out a little bit there. But most of mine is from brand deals as well. That's true for most full-time content creators. Most full-time content creators on YouTube, they don't necessarily live off their AdSense. A lot of full-time streamers can't live purely off of their donations and their members. They need sponsors in order to survive in most cases. Now with me, I do very well with affiliates. I do about $65,000 plus a year in affiliates. I do about, um, depending on the year, I've, and I haven't done the audiobook yet, I'll make um, somewhere between six and 9,000 off of my books, off of my book royalties. So my book royalties do okay. It is a great supplemental income stream, 65,000 with the affiliate marketing, 40,000 with, um, 
YouTube partner program, if I only upload about 40 videos a year, if I go back to doing 120 to 150 videos a year, I'll go to making 100,000 from the YouTube partner program. That's probably the goal for this year. If I can be consistent, do one or two streams a week, do one or two uploads a week on top of that, I'll be right back up to, you know, I'll be making 100,000 off the YouTube partner program. Right now it's 40 because I slacked during the pandemic years, had that pandemic depression going on, had that doom scrolling going on. So most people, it's brand deals. I do over 100K a year in brand deals this year. We're looking to double that. We basically, with our current partnerships in place, uh, believe that that's going to be once final. Deals are all inked and all together. Definitely believe we're going to double that. So I do, you know, last year I did over 100K in brand deals. We're looking to double that. Um, we did over 100K in Awesome Creator Academy with my group membership and my coaching. We're looking to uh, double, if not triple that this year uh, because we will finally introduce courses. I have a membership group that basically works as an evergreen, everlasting cohort. So you know how you do a cohort? It lasts like six or 12 weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is, and then you're kind of on your own, and then maybe they'll upsell you into a membership. I skip all of that and just say, hey, come be supported all year round. We'll do two office hours every single week. We'll keep up to date in the private membership group, you know, Monday through Friday. And basically you can just have this whenever you need it. Instead of opening up a cohort that I do two or four times a year, I just keep it going year round. Um, I don't feel like I've marketed that hard enough for a lot of you. But again, between that and one-on-one -on -one coaching, we'll double income on that this year. I still believe that brand deals will be our biggest overall revenue stream. I do think that for most creators, that's true. I think the only way for it to be bigger than brand deals is if you're not getting any brand deals or if you happen to sell your own product or service and you do it very well. So it is typical that will be brand deals. The best version of doing it is kind of like what I do, is that if you do long-term brand deals where every contract is a six to 12 month contract, you're not trying to do these one-time, one and done brand deals. I save one time, one and done brand deals for Instagram, for example, or maybe for my newsletter. But I try for the YouTube brand deals, six to 12 month contracts. I upsell in the package and say, we'll do amplification in Instagram for you where I have 25K followers. We'll do amplification in Twitter where I'm almost to 100,000 followers. We'll do amplification in LinkedIn if you want that because in LinkedIn, having 12,000 followers is a big deal. Most people don't. 90% of people do not have that in LinkedIn. Basically in LinkedIn, that's probably like top 3%. Uh, if you have over 10,000 followers in LinkedIn, it's like top 3% of all LinkedIn accounts. Um, so I'm pretty big over there for what it is. We have a newsletter that has over 50% open rates. Brands love newsletters with over 50% open rates. You could get sponsorships for your newsletter and you could make like $5,000. If you had a 30,000 subscriber newsletter in a good niche, you can make 5,000 a month with one brand on that newsletter. You could lock it down and you could get two brands and make 100,000 a year. If you had a really popping newsletter, you had between 25 to 50,000 subscribers to that newsletter getting 50% open rates, decent click rates. You pitch that to a brand, pitch that to two brands. You get year-long contracts on that. You show them what you're going to offer. You do $100,000 a year on your own newsletter. That's why community newsletters, besides being a hedge against censorship, cancel culture, and algorithms, it's also a really good opportunity, aside from dealing with those threats, it's good an opportunity to make substantially more money and to own the relationship with the brand, own the relationship with your community and make that a six figure relationship on something that's an asset that you own, which is your community newsletter. So you can make a hundred grand on a community newsletter. If you can get it to about 25 to 50,000 subscribers on an email newsletter community, get those open rates up to 50%, then you're talking like brands will eat that up. So that's another thing on brand deals. If you're not a large creator, you can do a lot of what I do. You can do UGC. If you do UGC, user generated content, it doesn't even, you don't even have to be getting the most views in the world. You build a good reputation. You represent the audience uh, and represent, you know, what the brand wants, but you're the voice of the audience. You have a great story to tell. Um, so you're the right representation there. You don't need that much reach. You just need brand affinity and brand awareness. So if you're the right fit for the brand, it's kind of like being a model. It's kind of like being a spokesperson. So if you do UGC, and then if there's a built-in NIL in there, uh, NIL is name, image, likeness. If there's an NIL play and a UGC play, 
it doesn't even matter if your channel is popping on YouTube or Instagram, wherever you're the right look, you're the right voice, you're the right representation, you're the right story. Well, if you name the right price, you're in there and you can get a long-term contract to be one of the faces and voices of a brand. And so you do a licensing deal for that. You do the licensing deal for that on the brand deal side. You lock in six to 12 month uh, contracts at a time. You do this with multiple brands. You do this with multiple brands. That's how you get to six figures on that. You can do multiple six figures on that. That's the play that I'm you know, constantly focusing on. That's why you know I don't always have to do dedicated integration videos. I can do shout outs. I can combine that as an upsell, even with the live stream stuff. I could do sponsored workshops on their platform, my platform. So at UGC, if you don't understand UGC, user generated content, those are the brand deals where you're doing stuff on the brand's social medias instead of on your social media. So if you're doing stuff for the brand's social media instead of strictly for your social media, then that's UGC. Now you can combine those things and you could do a little bit of both. I do a little bit of both if y'all are familiar. And so that's why, for example, Kajabi, as you saw as a sponsor, you're going to go and you're going to see me if you use my affiliate link for Kajabi as a sponsor. If you go to their website, you're going to see me on their website. That's a name, image, likeness, play. And then if I do things for them, there's UGC involved. And then in the other category, in sponsorships, they get mentions on my channel, amplification of their own post in social media, and then me making content they can use across their own platforms. So if you use that as your strategy, even if you're not a large creator, if you do high quality content or you're the right story in your niche, and when I say high quality, I mean production and editing values. If you can sell yourself as a name and a face and a story, or you can sell yourself as a really good producer, editor, and also maybe a good model. And you could do UGC for brands. I had a friend, she did a cooking channel. She couldn't get her own videos to get viral, but her videos that she made for the brand went viral and they hired her, not for her audience size, even though she was a decent sized creator, she was a mid-level creator with 80,000 subscribers. They didn't hire her for a subscriber account. They hired her because they felt her production and editing was better than theirs and they were a mega, um, thing in the baking niche. And then she started doing videos. Her videos that she made for them went viral. She could not get her own channel to go viral, but she can get their channel to go viral. Um, and she was making better content than them. So they hired her. She got a six figure salary. She would never be able to get on her own channel by being a creator for that brand. So ultimately I think for brand deals is how most content creators make their living. To be honest, it's not the YouTube partner program. It's not the AdSense. It's not the TikTok creative uh, fund, It um, the creator program. It is the brand deals. And I just told you that there's multiple ways to approach the brand deals. And that's, you know, that's what I do. That's part of what I teach is different is multiple monetization methods. If you add up enough monetization methods, you can get to six figures. Even if you're a smaller creator, if you do UGC, you can make decent money. If you grow an email list, you could. So there's a lot of ways to approach this. And that's you know kind of like um, the thing that I'm I'm talking about, and that's the thing I teach over an Awesome Creator Academy, and that's uh, where we help people as a group, but also one on one. So you got the email, just got the email. It wasn't in spam. Okay, well as long as you found it. Oh, shout out to my homie, Destiny FOMO. Thank you for becoming a YouTube channel member. Appreciate you. Bible and the Geek. Thank you, Wendy. I would love to make 70K annually from affiliate marketing. Yeah, it can be done. It can be done. The affiliate marketing side, if you, if you guys want me to break down the affiliate marketing side, for me, you know that one of my biggest affiliate plays is TubeBuddy, right? Um, they've been a sponsor in the past. So is vidIQ, actually. vidIQ and TubeBuddy have both been sponsors, but both of them are affiliates. With TubeBuddy, I do about 3000 to 3500 a month in affiliate uh, marketing. It's software as a service, right? It's a plug-in for YouTubers. So with um, TubeBuddy, I do 3000 to 3500 a month um, on the affiliate side. With Kajabi as an affiliate, I do about 1500 a month. Sometimes it's more whatever. So when you do the math on that, it gets you to about 5,000 there. Then I have multiple other miscellaneous affiliate programs that can be like 500 to a thousand dollars a month. Right. And recurring revenue, by the way, 
So the way that that works out is because software companies and plugin companies give people 30% commissions for the lifetime of their account. Now on Amazon affiliate, I used to make about $1,500 a month from Amazon's affiliate program. I'm actually gonna start making more on the Amazon affiliates program because Amazon now has Amazon Creator Hub and you can make videos of product reviews on Amazon. And if someone watches their video of your product review, and then buys the product, you get an affiliate commission there. Now the affiliate commissions on Amazon are only two to 8%, but because I'm in the camera and tech category, the two to 8% is significant. If someone buys a professional Sony camera lens, you guys know that I use Sony cameras, you know I use all this fancy camera gear that you see around me. The commissions on one professional Sony camera lens is a $90 commission, it is a $90 commission. So think about that. As much as people will dunk on me when I get 10,000 views on a video, you have to understand, when I get 10,000 10, views on a video, I make hundreds if not thousands of dollars on that video because when I do that, I'm reaching a specific target market. And it's also a smaller total addressable market. That's called TAM, right? When we talk about reach and building an audience and choosing a niche, TAM is what decides views. TAM decides views, not your subscriber count, not like to some, unless you're famous, it doesn't matter how popular you are, it doesn't matter how many subs you are. If you're not strictly an entertainer, a comedian, a class clown, then total addressable market is what matters. Tam, Tam decides views. There's more views for Star Wars than there is for creating, being a YouTube creator. There's more views for the new iPhone or the Apple Vision Pro than there is being a YouTuber. It's called total addressable market. Okay. So, the market of people who can spend $3,000 on a Sony camera is a small market compared to everything else. So if I get 10,000 views on if I do a Sony camera review and because I'm not specifically a tech creator, maybe I get 10,000, 20,000 views and people will dunk on me. However, every one of those people is someone who might be shopping for a Sony piece of gear. And if I sell one of the professional G Master lenses that I have on my shelf, if I sell that in the video and people buy it, it's a $90 commission for every single one that I sell. So I only need about 12 sales on 10,000 views to make $1,000 on the video on top of the ad revenue being higher and me getting a $10 RPM. So I'll make about maybe... $100, $150 in ad revenue on a video that gets 10,000 views, but on the affiliate sales, I'll make $1,000. So it's worth it to make a $1,000 video, even if it gets less views sometimes. And that's why people cannot judge things on the front end of YouTube. The back end of YouTube is where full-time creators make their money. And I know people in the tech niche, in tech YouTubers I know, just on their Amazon affiliate program, some of them are making two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year, and I've seen the payments. I know smaller creators that are at like, and when I say smaller, I mean compared to those mega creators with millions of subscribers. I know a small creator in the tech niche that just hit a hundred thousand subscribers. It's one of my coaching clients, and uh, has had a ten thousand dollar month on Amazon before in the tech accessories category because of bulk volume for people who pay buy tech accessories for their phones because it sells out the category. And I've known creators uh, that have 20,000 subscribers in tech that do five grand a month on affiliate marketing. And then they make another five grand a month on brand deals because of the right alignment and the right partnership. So the thing is, making $100,000 a year, making 10 grand a month is possible. And you don't have to be a mega creator to do it, but you do have to have a specific business model that aligns to those opportunities. And you have to have that business model in play and understood fairly early in your career so that you can build momentum toward it. And so you can keep playing the game the right way. And so that whatever you do get, you maximize the profit off of your reach. You maximize the revenue tied to your reach. So we got a couple of super chats, but I want to get to uh, this question from Effective Mindset. <clears throat> so Effective Mindset says, if you have a Shopify store at um, $49 a month, okay, I think it's supposed to be $39 a month, but okay, whatever. So if you have a Shopify store, at $49 a month, but you only get two sales every six months, would you close it or keep it up for your audience? It depends on what you're selling. 
it depends on what you're selling. Because if you are selling merchandise um, or print on demand products with your Shopify store, if you're selling uh, merchandise or print on demand products with your Shopify store, then I would say you could probably switch your Shopify store to being fourth wall or spread shop. And if you do fourth wall, they use Printify, which is really good quality. So it's probably what you're using um, if you're using Shopify. If you're doing Shopify for your merchandise, if you're doing it for your merchandise and you only do two sales a month, you might as well pay $0 up front and be on either fourth wall, which integra integrates into YouTube shopping. So it'll sit under your videos in your uh, merch shelf, your shopping shelf on YouTube. So you might as well use either fourth wall or you might as well use um, spread shop. I think Teespring might be struggling right now. So I would just use spread shop or fourth wall. Fourth wall has the custom look if you want something customized to look more like how Shopify looks. They're also very good if you use a custom domain name already. So you could do fourth wall. They're not a sponsor, at least not yet, uh, for $0. You could do fourth wall for $0. You can get a dot .store domain so that you could do something like I have robertoblake.store, and then that points to fourth wall and my merch site there. And I went with them, and they use Printify, and then you get very good quality stuff as far as the you know, the print on demand side of the things and you'd pay $0 up front and then you just charge what you want to charge for your merchandise. And then you have your profit set to that. Then I would tell you what you should be doing is if you're only making two sales every six months, you should be promoting it more. You should use your YouTube community tab and then you should do some mockups. You could use placeit.net. You do some mockups and then You'll have some, you know, mock-ups and designs that you can use. You can use Place It for free, or they have a cheap plan. I think it's like eighty bucks a year, or something like that, five dollars a month, or something. You can do mock-ups of your products for your print-on-demand stuff. You, uh, or you can use the free version. You could use the YouTube Community tab to make these ads and put them in there and link to your shop, and then you could promote it. You're not promoting it enough. You could wear your merchandise in your videos, and you could promote it in every video. What I would tell you though is, don't slap your logo on merchandise and then expect it to sell. You guys can't sell anything because you're just slapping your logo on there and your audience doesn't care about your logo. Why did I use creator as the thing on my hat? That's not a logo. That's something that's an identity that my audience cares about is they want to say, I'm a creator and now I'm going to wear a hat or I'm going to wear a shirt or I'm going to wear a hoodie that says it. And the thing is I'm making some, I have some new designs. There are going to be some graffiti designs with creator and also with other things that people identify with. I'm going to use culture to sell my merch and clothing line. So use culture, think like a clothing line instead of thinking like a famous, a famous content creator can slap their logo on anything if they're Mr. Beast. Don't think like you're a famous content creator. Think like you're building a clothing line. Clothing line is built on culture and community identity. So make a culture play, do that. Use either spread shop or use fourth wall, do it at $0 cost up front. prove to yourself that you can make and sell merch then it makes sense. You don't need a Shopify store. If you wanted the custom domain and the custom look, Fourth Wall does that. And you could get a .store domain and point it there. Um, so that's what you would do in that situation. And that's what would probably make a lot more sense for you. That's a, that's a good question. Let me go ahead and get to uh, some of these super chats. So shout out to Destiny FOMO, becoming a channel member. We have the Chow Time Pod. Appreciate you. $49.99 Super Chat. Nice. Appreciate everything you give us. Just want to show some love. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do we have a... We have a Super Chat sound effect. I need to find it here on my soundboard. I know we have one somewhere. Let's see. We have music that I can play in the background. That's a sponsor tag. Up oh, here is Super Chat. Super Chat. All right. So we got another question. Twenty dollars from Saif Seven One One. I think that is, and I think that's, I think that's twenty dollars, even though it's a different currency. Uh, the question reads as follows. Thank you, Roberto. I'm a full-time physician in Switzerland. Okay, so that's from Swiss money. My 
Arabic medical channel grew to around 37,000 subscribers in 4.5 months, posting once a week. Fantastic. Two problems, burnout and not knowing the first step to generate income. Okay, so depending on, I think that your language probably means that you're in places where you're not getting as much ad revenue. So the language and localization is your barrier to ad revenue. So that's, that's interesting. Hmm. I think you should consider until YouTube does AI auto dubbing, you might want to consider whether you could take the same style that you're doing of content and start making English content. If that's a, a revenue generating thing that you want to do, but for burnout, and I wrote about this in my book, I wrote about burnout in my book, create something awesome. And there's an entire chapter on it. You have to figure out whether you're actually burnt out or whether you're depressed. Now, the thing is, the, and here's part of how you might know the difference. If you're burnt out, then there are things that you need to address and solve. And you need to figure out whether this is physical burnout or whether this is mental exhaustion. And you might need to resolve those things. So that means you're either not getting the results you want out of the process, which you looks like you are in terms of subscribers and reach. So you should be validated by your growth and that part. Or with the once a week, maybe you're exhausted because you're doing your full-time job as a physician, and then you're burning the candle at both ends by doing this content creation thing. And then there's parts of it that doesn't feel worth it because you say you're struggling with generating income from it and monetizing it. So you're getting the reach that you want, and that's validating. You're building this wonderful reputation, and that's great. You have a great relationship with your audience, but you don't have revenue to justify it. Now you might need to solve for yourself and say, do I need revenue to justify this? You might make good money as a physician in Switzerland. I don't know how it compares to the United States in terms of that, because you guys have socialized medicine over there, I believe. So maybe it's not a good salary. Maybe it's good enough to do well, but not good enough to feel like you're doing great. So that'd be maybe the difference between debt and here in the United States. So then maybe because you're not doing like swimming in money, you feel like, well, I'm doing all this hard work on the content creation side and I'm doing hard work as a doctor, but I'm not making enough money to feel like my effort is being truly rewarded. That could be a problem. So you might have to solve that. Now, here's the thing. If you're depressed, there's a really chance. There, the way you'd know partly is, am I healthy? Is my money good? Do I have reasons for self-esteem? Do I have good relationships in my life? You know? So why am I so wildly unhappy? There might be emotional things that you need to resolve there, and you might actually be going through a bout of depression, and there might be other external things that are triggering or affecting your depression or a conflict in life that's unresolved, and the thing is you might need to resolve that, and then you might feel better. So I'd figure out whether I'm depressed or whether I'm burnt out. If I'm burnt out, it means I'm not enjoying the process of the thing I'm doing, and I'm feeling robbed of that because I don't feel rewarded for it, or I feel like it's too painful, or I've turned something I like into a chore, those, or again, I'm just working way too hard and it's catching up with me physically. Those would be indications that you're going through a process of burnout right now or a form of burnout. But if you're just not enjoying anything, you might be beginning to experience depression and you might need to take greater steps to deal with that. So very good question, very important question. Let's get back to the live chat. Colin says, didn't see you on YouTube, but saw you on X, came on over, multi-streaming got me here. I know a lot of people are dunking on multi-streaming, but it works. Multi-streaming is your hack to getting around the algorithm and getting around notification systems. If you multi-stream and then you tell people where you want to be supported and you tell them a reason to support you there, you tell them a goal you have for being supported in that place, or you tell them how great or better the experience is in that place, then they help you achieve your goal. And by streaming in all places, you can reach them where they are at at the time, and then you can pull them to you. You can pull them to you. Multi-streaming is free advertising. It's a way to pull people to you. And it's good for your brand no matter what because you're building all your platforms at once with less effort. And that's why we use StreamYard, and that's why they're a sponsor. So you know, that's a whole thing. That's why I believe in it. It's the same reason we use Opus Clip for repurposing. We use Opus Clip. We do our repurposing. It gives us a way to easily put ourselves and make content in every platform. Now, would it be better, in theory, once you get a team, 
to make dedicated content for each of your major platforms. Once you have a team, that makes sense. But until we have a team, we use tools. That's the other thing I can tell you, how to be a successful full-time solo content creator. See, I have a team for Awesome Creator Academy. I don't have a team for Roberto Blake yet. The most is the overlap between my sister who works as my personal assistant and my admin in Awesome Creator Academy. She's an admin in my overall business and brand, but it doesn't really help that much for the YouTube side, aside from the fact she does admin work when it comes to some of my brand deals and my follow-up and my speaking engagements, which is still more about my personal brand than my actual content creation when it comes to a team and help. My brother helps work a little bit on production, but mostly behind the scenes with helping me do the renovation stuff to the basement, doing some other things. He might be coming on to do some editing at some point. He helps me with production twice a month um, when I do uh, some other stuff that you haven't released yet for you guys. So that's all back end. But does it really help the YouTube channel in the things that matter? The editing for the YouTube channel, the production of the live streams, the moderation of the live streams, the thumbnail design, the research, all those things. I do everything that you have to do as a YouTuber still by myself solo and have been doing that consistently since 2013 of taking it seriously versus dabbling. I've been in YouTube since 2006, but I didn't take it seriously until 2013. So over a decade now, I've been doing this solo, making it sustainable and scaling it to six figures. It can be done. It's not ideal to do that as a solo creator. And if you want to go bigger, you build a team. I was going to build a team. Then the pandemic happened because I wanted local. So now I'm doing the smart thing, family and friends. So, so again, the thing that can scale you as a solo creator is your tools. Scaled streaming by doing multi-streaming and simulcasting, use StreamYard. Great tool. Take those streams or even your regular content, run it through Opus Clip, now your repurposing is going to be done without you hiring an editor. It's using the AI tools, doing the captioning, doing all the things, and it's going to do it very well. And you can still tweak, edit, modify it, schedule it, and then the machine does the rest, and then it uploads across multiple platforms. Boom, 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 boom. You can take the transcript from StreamYard, use one of my AI creator prompts. We have that um, over on Awesome Creator Academy. It's a $9 thing. I did 200 chat GPT prompts for productivity systems. So I have 200 chat GDP prompts that do different tasks. I broke it out to, I think, 10 categories, 20 tasks per category. It's hyper meticulous. I was very anal about it. And the, the thing about it is you can run your transcript that you copy and paste from StreamYard. Or if you're on the paid version of ChatGPT, you can upload the document. Then you could tell it, take that information from my video and turn this into a listicle article with this tone, eliminate passive voice, do this, do this. You write a sophisticated prompt or you copy one of mine and it'll chunk that out for you. And then you have a post that works for your newsletter, could work for your LinkedIn post, could work for your x.com, formerly Twitter post. So now you have your text out of this. If you're doing a live stream, you might as well turn it into an audio podcast if you're not relying on visuals. You strip out the audio from StreamYard with one download, you upload to your podcasting platform. If you use Podcastle and their AI, it'll do the audio editing for you using AI magic. It, it, uh, that's what they call it. They call it AI magic in Podcastle. And then the audio will be mastered and cut and clipped and done everything right for you. And then you distribute your podcast to all the other audio platforms. So if you're a live streamer, you can then live stream to Podcast Pipeline. You can live stream to Opus Clip for the repurposing pipeline for clip show and vertical video for short form, distribute to all the platforms and schedule it. So you can set aside two hours and schedule a whole week of content across three or four platforms, just like that. And then with ChatGPT, you can repurpose the transcript into written content or snippets. Or if you interview guests, you can tell it to find quotes. Then you take those quotes and like, all right, give me 10 quotes from my guest. Boom, boom, boom. You take that. You go into Canva. You make a nice little uh, quote graphic. You post that into Instagram. Now you've got some extra Instagram content. Or you can even say, okay, give me these like 
tips or listicles or whatever, take the listicles from your episode after ChatGPT finds the listicles for you. You go into Canva, you make slides for those listicles, then you make an Instagram carousel. Eventually, I'm going to be actually selling Instagram carousel templates on top of the YouTube starter kit thumbnail templates and all the graphics templates, the channel art templates. We're going to make a thing for Instagram. We're going to make Instagram carousel templates. You can find all my products at awesomecreatoracademy.com, linked in the description. But we're going to do that because, again, you can just, oh, chat GPT, take my transcript, give me the list. Oh, I got the list. Cool. I'm going to go to in, into Canva now. Now I'm going to make a carousel. I'm going to go to Photoshop. Now I'm going to make a carousel. Boom. You've got your Instagram content. If you limit the slides to being five slides, you can even use these as community tab post in YouTube and post your five slides in the community tab in YouTube and you can still take those five slides and post them as a five slide carousel in Instagram and take advantage of that. Oh, and the visual quotes, you can take the visual quotes graphics and you can post those in LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, x.com, formerly Twitter, and that's content too. So you see what I'm saying? We have a whole workflow and you can take this whole workflow from your live streams and your long form VODs. And if you just use the right processes, it funnels out to being content for all of your platforms. And as a solo creator, as a solo creator who doesn't have a team, that's how you use tools and templates in order to scale. Use tools, templates, and technology in order to scale as a solo creator. And you treat basically each of your tools or pieces of tech as the supplement to having a team member or employee. And that's how you would get that done. So, um, Bible and the Geek has a question. My channel has 529 and about one fourth of the watch hours for YPP. At what point should I do brand deals or should I target another income stream first? I would target another income stream first. I would look at affiliate marketing as my stepping stone to brand deals because I can make money immediately and fast without permission. And I could do it for the same brands that I would want sponsorship from. So I would look at the brands I want sponsorship from, find out who has an affiliate deal, become an affiliate. Then I'm on their radar anyway. I have a reason to promote them. I have a reason to tag them in social media. Now I'm advocating for them and I still can get something out of it. It'll just be performance-based. So since it'll be performance-based, that's what the affiliate marketing side is. Affiliate marketing is performance-based commissions. For everybody who's like, oh, is affiliate marketing a scam? No, it's just performance-based commissions. It's you make it, take it. You eat what you kill. It's make it, take it. You sell something for a company, you get a percentage, no salary. So being an affiliate marketer and doing affiliate links, Amazon is your best bet starting out for most of you. You will not make a lot of money at first unless you're in like tech beauty or lifestyle, you won't make a lot of money at first with Amazon. Book reviews won't make you a ton of money. We used to make more by doing volume sales. They changed the rules on us. But if you go directly to brands, you get 10, 20, 30% commissions. So if you think about it, at your regular job, what would it look like if you got 10, you know, if you got like 10 bucks for every hundred bucks you made your employer, if you got 10%, if you made um, $10 for every hundred dollars you brought your employer in the last year, what would that look like for you? That'd probably be almost life-changing money. So getting a percentage of what you make a company is a good deal. And so when anyone says, oh, affiliate marketing is a scam, they don't know what they're talking about. It's just commission sales. That's all it is. And all you have to do is pick a reputable company and either pick hardware or software. You don't make money if people are not going to stay on the software. People only keep software that they use, that they rely on or are happy with. So there's no scam, no downside. Hardware, Amazon, and hardware stuff has a 30-day return policy. There's no downside. If they don't like it, you don't make money because the payouts are 60 days later because there's a 30-day return policy. So there's not really, I'm sure there's some jack hole somewhere that figures out how to turn affiliate marketing into a scam. But by its nature, most of affiliate marketing is not going to be a scam because you literally have to be within the return policy window to make any money. No one keeps software that they don't like. And with Amazon and hardware, everybody can return something in 30 days. That's how it works. So I don't know what to tell you. Just go into software and hardware and there's no scam. Like, so I would target affiliate marketing 
as a precursor to brand deal sponsorship because it's literally promoting the products or services of a brand anyway. This one is just permissionless. So I would do that. And it's not incredibly difficult to link this in your previous videos as well, to link the affiliate links in your previous video. I would use Genius Link to track all of this because if you use Genius Link to track all this, when you want to do a brand deal, you can put together a media kit. We sell media kits on awesomecreatoracademy.com. We have the brand deal starter kit. You get three media kits in there plus a bunch of other stuff. Um, so we have that. You build a media kit. In your own custom media kit, you include things like data points on your previous sales and your affiliate marketing. You put together a case study around how good of an affiliate marketer you were. And you can also do tracking links with Genius Link, collect all this click-through rate data so you can prove here's how much traffic I drive, here's how much sales I get, and here's how much traffic I drive, the thing they care about. And then, hey, look at me. And then it's an easier pitch to sell a brand when you can show them traffic and conversion numbers. So if you can show traffic and conversion numbers, it's not hard to sell yourself as a, a, you know, a good uh, brand deal candidate. And then with brand deals, a lot of you need to think about what brands you specifically want to partner with. And by being an affiliate marketer, it makes you intentional and you have a reason to tag them in social media when you're promoting them. You have a reason to promote them even without a contract because you're an affiliate who will make money doing it. So you want to be a brand ambassador and advocate before you're being paid by being an affiliate marketer for the company. So you want to do that. The other thing you want to do another in terms of another potential revenue stream is even if you're a small creator, consider if you have a community and you're almost to a thousand people, start trying to turn the 1000 people or less that you have, start recruiting and trying to get your 1000 true fans. Start trying to get your 1000 to true fans and your 1000 true fans are people that spend some kind of money with you a true fan is anybody here who's super chatted a true fan is anyone who's bought my book a true fan is anyone who's a channel member a true fan is anyone who's ever bought anything from awesomecreatoracademy.com so start getting your true fans by making some product under ten dollars that they can buy with you to say thank you because they're going to give ten dollars to somebody this week and it's not you so create more value for them. Trust the value that you create for them. Get them to spend 5 or $10 with you that they're going to spend on snacks, Starbucks, coffee, a faceless corporation that doesn't care about them. It should not be that difficult to get people to spend $10 with you if you're creating value for them than a faceless corporation that does not care about them and does not give a crap about them. So have that mentality going into it, and then everything gets a lot easier to accomplish you know, long term. I'll give you a primary example. Um, the AI creator prompts that I did, the AI creator prompts that I did is a $9 product, right? And the thing is it's, um, over 200 chat GPT, um, prompts that I wrote. And it has also my advanced prompts that I use in my business. So, uh, excuse me, I'm going to link to that here in the chat and it's only like nine bucks. If I've ever created any value for any of you watching this, go check out this product. It is literally $9. Buy it now if I've ever created value for you and you want to support me. So I just left it in the chat. It's awesomecreatoracademy.com slash creator prompts. I just linked it up in the chat. It's a primary example of how to sales pitch to your audience. Hey, if you love what I'm doing and you want a way to support me, here's how you can support me. Now, if you don't have a product, you do a Patreon. And you tell people, hey, if you want to support what I'm doing, you want to encourage me to keep going, here's my Patreon link. And you can do that. Or you can do a buy me a coffee link. And you can say, hey, if you want to do a one-time donation and you want me to keep most of it and I'm not monetized on YouTube yet, then use my buy me a coffee link just drop me $3, $5, whatever you can. It's a great way to just, you know, encourage me to keep going and to show me that I created value for you. So that's how you would do that. You pitch, you buy me a coffee, you pitch your Patreon, or you sell a product directly. You make a like under $10 product like I did, and that's your first start. And what you want to do in your goal, in my opinion, is to get your 1,000 true fans to support you and show up for you. And so you start, in my mind, with $9 products. Now, unless you're like, already established or you've built a bigger audience, then maybe you can go with something bigger. But I think $9 products are an easy way to build goodwill and to get people to trust you to over deliver for them later. So, you know, I do $9 products that should normally be 20 to $50 products for what they actually accomplish for somebody. And I sell them at $9 because it's a way to like prove the value and to generate trust and confidence. So a lot of you should do that. For a lot of you, 
merch isn't going to do it. People might have enough hats or hoodies, but if you make it dope, it speaks to their identity. That's an easier way to sell. So Brandon's Recovery Acts, how do you get a newsletter? I actually did um, a video on how to start your own newsletter. I need to do an updated one for 2024, but um, you can start a newsletter with something like ConvertKit, for example. I use ConvertKit. Um, what I should probably do is I should probably just go ahead and I should link that in the description of this video for you guys so that you can use that. Uh, you can sign up. They have a free version, kind of like how Dropbox has a free version. So um, you can use ConvertKit. And let me find my link for that. <clears throat> you can sign up with my link. You can start your own newsletter. Um, and you can start for free. There is a free tier. You can start for free. You can get a free trial. So I just want to make sure I drop that link in there in my description for you so that you can do that. Um, so just give me one second. But yeah, I love ConvertKit. The good thing about ConvertKit is, at least from my point of view, one of the best parts about ConvertKit is the fact that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, since you can sign up for free, you can start getting value from it and you can link out to things that you want to sell or promote or to affiliate links and it would actually help you. So let me do this. Start your newsletter for free with convert convert kits all right so i'm putting that in the description i'm going to post it here in the chat as well if you guys want to check that out so you can um, use my link there and you can start your own free newsletter once you have your newsletter and the way we typically do this is you make a newsletter and you can make an offer now you can link to your newsletter and say hey just sign up for my newsletter just sign up for my newsletter or you can make a freebie like I did. The freebie that I made is this thing here, um, the 12 week uh, creator playbook. So the way that I grow my newsletter is that I offer the 12 week um, creator playbook for YouTubers. We're also working on um, a podcaster's playbook, uh, but I'm not done with that because it's like 18 slides, but this one's actually really good and it gives you a 12 week outline to focus on leveling up as a content creator. You can do this as a beginner, or if you're still a content creator, but you're like, I need an, a way to focus this year and really step up. This gives you 12 areas that you can improve in. It gives you a 12 week guide. And the thing is um, we drill down into this, we give you the outline and then we give you action items for everything. So we gave you an, basically we gave you a focus, a resource and an assignment. That's what differs from like the way that other people approach things. I want you to actually get real value from this. I need and want you to do the work. So we give you a focus of saying, focus on this. Here are resources that you can utilize. So we give you a tool. We tell you what you should use to accomplish your goal. And then we give you an assignment so you can practice this. So we give you a goal to focus on, a resource to um, utilize, and then assignment to carry out so you can start seeing results for yourself and so you can see improvement for yourself. So we worked out this 12-week guide format. We picked together this pretty PDF for you with these slides. And so... Um, yeah, that's what we put together for you. And then, of course, obviously, we encourage you to join us in Awesome Creator Academy where you can help you accomplish these goals. So the thing is, we put together a 12-week creator playbook. I made this my freebie that people can get for $0 by just signing up for my newsletter. And they get this PDF right away, lickety-split, in their inbox. And then they get my newsletter. And then we give them free value in the newsletter. You go into um, what I do is with ConvertKit, the reason I use ConvertKit is I have an automated evergreen newsletter, plus I write these emails every week or every other week for you. I handcraft my emails. I don't have a staff member doing it for me. It's Roberto writing you the newsletter and putting together the information. I don't just curate, oh, here's what's going on in the creator economy. Here's what's going on in the internet. I write to you a you know, letter and an essay and some advice from you know my perspective and I cite my sources and I tell you, hey, you know this is what I wanna do. Um, this is why I'm thinking about, this is what I'm seeing. Um, so that's how we do it. Up, oh, shout out to Pat Flynn. Appreciate you, brother. So yeah, so the, the thing that you do with the newsletter is you put together a freebie and you promote that. And if I'm, if you're me, you literally find a way to promote it every single day 
in your other platforms and I promote on YouTube in my community tab at least once a week. And now what I'm doing is I'm linking to it in the info card in every one of my videos and in every one of my live streams and the description of my live streams. And I am making it the pinned comment in my videos from now on. I'm making it the pinned comment in my community tab post. Like I'm aggressively pushing people onto the newsletter. That's how you grow a newsletter. I will be doing a new video about that 2024. One of the ways to be a full-time content creator long-term is to own your own newsletter. Your newsletter is the thing that you own. You don't wanna be a digital sharecropper forever. And like I told you, if you can get 25,000 to 30,000 people on a newsletter, sorry, 25,000 to 50,000 people on a newsletter, you can make up to $5,000 in sponsorships per month. You get two big sponsors and you can make $100,000 a year just on your newsletter. If you get it to 25 to 50,000 subscribers on your newsletter, 50% open rates of those newsletters. That's about what I have. You can get 5,000 to 10,000 a month if that's your situation. So it's growing your newsletter is the thing we really need to start focus on. I know it's great to publicly run up numbers, but the numbers you have in the back end, your own newsletter where you can reach out, contact people, no algorithm, no censorship, no cancel culture, none of that. It's like, okay, let's go. And the other thing is having your own customers selling at least some kind of product. And you want to get your first 1,000 true fans. You need your own customer database. If you have your own data and you own it, your own analytics and you own it, your own website and you own it, your own newsletter and you own it, your own access to your community and you own it, you're no longer a digital sharecropper for the platforms. You actually own your brand, own your business, own your reputation at that point. So that means that everything you build is a lot harder to dismantle. And then when you're not relying on things like the TikTok creator fund or the YouTube partner program or whatever, and you have these options, then it's much easier for you to be full-time and stay full-time because it's very hard to dismantle your ability to create an income at that point. And so you have a much more secure income, you own it, and that's why I encourage that. And that's also one of the other reasons why I'm a big fan of being platform agnostic. You stream on all platforms, you repurpose to all platforms, you play in all platforms so that you have a hedge, um, uh, you know, and you can have the maximum aggregate audience. You funnel that maximum aggregate audience to your own newsletter so you have access to them. And then you make your own offers. And now you have your own relationship with brand deals that's not entirely tied to the platform. You have your own revenue streams not tied entirely to the platform. You have your own affiliate marketing not entirely tied to the platform. And so the affiliate links with your software companies or your one-offs from Amazon, if you're an entertainer, it'll be the one-offs from Amazon or whatever, your partnership deals, you can use all that funnel into your newsletter. So you have affiliate revenue, you'll have partnership revenue, and then you have to sell your own products and, you know, and services. You can sign your, you can have your own membership community. It doesn't have to be Patreon. You can have your own site or you can do Patreon, whatever. But this means that the platforms are not in control anymore if you do those things. So if you won't, don't want to rely on or be entirely beholden to the platforms, that is how you would do it. And you can still be a full-time content creator. You have your own membership. You get your own 1,000 true fans. You get your own 1,000 true fans. You get them on a $9 a month subscription. Just even a $9 a month subscription with 1,000 true fans, that's $9,000 a month. By the time you play your platform fees, your platform doesn't take a percentage. It takes a flat rate. You'll be keeping over $8,000 after processing fees and platform fees. You'll still be making over $8,000 on a $9 a month membership for 1,000 true fans. And you're making six figures on memberships alone if you do that. If you grow the email list big enough, you can make two big brand deals, five grand, 50% open rate on a 25 to 50,000 subscriber list. Boom, boom, boom. $10,000 a month, $100,000 after fees. And you know, you're still good. Maybe not quite after taxes. <laughs> so that's how you would approach it. And then, oh, you're a full-time content creator, regardless of what the platforms want to do with affiliate marketing. It just depends on who your affiliate partners are. It depends on what you can drive in revenue there. Like I said, in a high end niche like tech, getting $1,000 could be 10 to 20 sales. If it's high end tech, if it's not high end tech, then it might need to be a higher volume of sales. It might be a hundred uh, to get $1,000 here or there it might require anywhere from 10 to 100 sales. But if you control your own platform and it's niche enough, maybe that's not so hard. So, and, that, and that's it. That's one time sales though. If you're in a niche where you can do 
let's say you are in an education niche though. And let's say someone like Pat Flynn makes a course and you're an affiliate. If you get 30% commissions and somebody sells a 699 course, like that, that's my plan in the future, by the way, I'm going to sell a 699 course. I'm only going to take on a hundred affiliate partners, but let's say I had 10 that were really reliable. All right. I'm going to have people that already have an audience and have an email list. That's what it's going to take to be an affiliate with me. People literally have to fill out an application to be an affiliate of mine. I'm not going to do an open affiliate program. I only want a hundred people and I'm going to do a sales training with them once a month. If I charge $6.99 for my brand deal secrets course, and if I charge $2.99 for my personal branding course, then that means at 30%, my affiliates of brand deal secrets will get $200 for every sale. And that means that my um, personal branding course, the people will get uh, $99 every sale. That means for that person to make $1,000, they know that they'd have to send to sell 10 of the personal branding course, or if it was the brand deal secrets, because they make $200 a sale, they know they have to make five sales a month. If they do that and they make $1,000, because I gave them 30%, that means I'm making $2,000. So if I just do the math, if out of 100 potential affiliates, I only have 10 that are reliable, I would make $20,000 a month. That's how that works. And that's how it works in the education niche. In the entertainment niche, you're not going to do nearly as well with affiliate marketing. You're going to have to go the brand deal partnerships. If you're an entertainer, it's going to be much harder to separate from being a digital sharecropper if you're an entertainer. It's not impossible, but it will be much, much more difficult because the income streams are going to tie much more to your reach and reputation with the brand deals. It's going to be harder to move entertainment people to doing affiliate marketing unless you're a lifestyle influencer, a tech influencer, or a beauty influencer. That will go tied to consumerism. That's an Amazon affiliate play with the Amazon influencer program. That makes sense. But for hardware and software, harder to move entertainment content to hardware and software. And the real money is in hardware and software. That's the real money. But if you're in productivity niche, education niche, language learning niche, career development niche, that's where um, that's where the software services, hardware, photography, text, cinematography, creative services, graphic design, that's where hardware and software lives. And that's where those niches are wildly more profitable sooner rather than later, where you don't have to be huge to be very profitable. So there are niches that lend themselves to being a full-time creator faster than others. Entertainment is very slow. It's very hard, but it's not impossible. And I know a lot of you love it. You want to do entertainment. There are ways to make it work, but it does require a lot more of building the platform. And it does leave you very much vulnerable to being a digital sharecropper for the platform. Um, Stacy says, what's the difference between your pro group membership and a regular membership? If I haven't started my channel yet, should I join the regular membership and upgrade to the pro group? So right now there's no such thing as a regular membership. We call it the pro group. It is the membership, but we call it the pro group because the goal is to be a professional content creator. So the pro group right now is just a branding term that we use. So there's not an upgrade path. However, I am making a, another subscription. It's not, it doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist yet. I'm making a $9 subscription called the Creator Vault. The Creator Vault is going to have our 100 PDF library, and it's going to have exclusive ad-free videos, and that's what people will pay the $9 a month for. Um, and that's at awesomecreatoracademy.com. The Creator Vault is coming soon. My goal is for a 1,000 true fans to sign up for the $9 Creator Vault. But... Right now, we have um, 80 members in Awesome Creator Academy. Um, we will probably cap that at 200 members because we're going to be more aggressive. We're going to get to over 100, 150 members this year. We'll cap it at about 2, 250. But with the pro group, the goal is you want to be a full-time content creator. So we wanted to make something for some of the people just starting out and to give them resources. So that's why we're going to do the $9 creator vault and then we'll have an upgrade pathway to the pro group right now all we have membership wise is the pro group the pro group's the only membership right now <clears throat> that's a good question i need to do a stream that does go more or make a video sales letter that explains more of awesome creator academy and what i offer uh, because I do know that for a lot of you, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so, you know, some of that's kind of uh, 
My bad. Um, oh, hey, we teach AI art. Running AI art channel. How do we know when we're ready to start YouTube memberships? What membership services would you suggest? This is a great question. Start YouTube memberships. YouTube actually released a new feature where you can schedule members, quote unquote, only content to go live on your channel, to be up published on your channel so that members can just get early access. So you can give them like, oh, you get this video two days early, three days early, a week early. So I would start memberships by just doing early access and would start memberships by doing a monthly, maybe a monthly members live stream. You can make some members only content in advance to put it on your channel. And that's how I would do it. Um, if you have the option already to do YouTube memberships, it's worth building that out, considering that and thinking about what will be in that YouTube membership. Now, like I said, I'm going the route of, I have a plan for the YouTube channel members here. Mostly you guys are just supporting, but we do have actually a hundred exclusive videos for members. Cause what I do is there's videos I like archived. There's videos that I made specifically for members only. So you guys have that at the $5 member tier. I'm consolidating everything into a $5 member tier on this channel. And then I'm going to do a $9 tier that offers something completely different over on awesome creator Academy with the creator vault channel members on my channel. For example, I will do, I'm going to do random lotteries to do pre-recorded short channel reviews for a channel member. So that's something we're gonna do. But here's the thing, for you, because you're in the AI art niche, I would say that something else you could do for your um, channel members is that in your members only area and tab, you'll post some of your prompts for AI every week, because you're an AI art channel, that's unique value that only you can offer. So you'll give them like the scoop on prompts you never share and you can post that in your uh, members area. So that's a tip only for you that's specific to your channel. Um, Splarum says he has a question or they have a question. My viewers want more content more often. The problem is I don't have, I don't want to sacrifice quality in order to make that happen. Could now be the time to start doing short form content to fill the gap. Actually, I wouldn't do short form content to fill the gap. What I would do is um, create a goal for your audience that lets them help you do the content more often. Tell them, hey, to do the content more often, I have to hire help. To hire help, we have to reach bigger and greater goals. Help the channel grow to this level, support and be a member, and your contributions go toward me getting some more help full time so that I can keep giving you more content at the same level of quality that you want and that I'm used to giving you and that you deserve. And so make it a community goal. If your content, if your audience wants more content from you and you don't want to sacrifice the quality, put that goal to them and say, if you want this, we're going to have to make it happen together and you're going to have to meet me halfway. So incentivize the audience. If they want more and they're demanding more, tell them what you need in order to make that happen and then see if they show up for you. That's what I would say. Fantastic question. We got some really good questions. How can I get sponsored by TubeBuddy or VidIQ? Uh, Brandon, I don't think, since your thing is addiction recovery, I don't really think it's a match made in heaven. It doesn't necessarily make sense for your audience. You have to do a sponsorship that aligns to your audience. You can't do a sponsorship just because they pay well or you want to make money or because you like the company. It has to be something that your audience can use based on the journey that you're taking them on. George Perez says, hey, Roberto, do you still do channel reviews? Yes, uh, but... Um, we didn't do a lot of stuff here in January while I was doing backend stuff. I was working on business stuff and I was recording videos that were going to release for February. So I was doing that. So, uh, we might do channel, re a channel review stream in February. Um, but other than that, um, we'll just have to wait on them. How can you, oh, I love this question. So how can, uh, Sam proof X, how can we calculate TAM if we don't have any previous analytics to determine it for ourselves? Great question. So TAM stands for total addressable market. What I would do is this, I would find creators in your niche and I would find them at the following levels. I would find creators and I need, you need to find like five or 10 of these people per every level, by the way. 
if you want to find the total address market, you could do about five. So I would do five creators at the following levels. Find five creators in your niche that are at 1,000 subscribers if you're not at 1,000 subscribers yet. Find five creators in your niche at 10,000 subscribers. Find five creators in your niche that are at 50,000 subscribers or roughly around there. Find five creators in your niche that are at 100,000 subscribers or right around there. Find five creators in your niche that are at 500,000 subscribers or right around there. And then find five creators in your niche that are a million subscribers or over, okay? So that's six levels, okay? It's six levels. And I'm going to repeat that for you. I'm going to repeat that one more time for you. It's six levels. Find five creators at each of these six levels. 1,000 subscribers, 10,000 subscribers, 50,000 subscribers, 100,000 subscribers, 500,000 subscribers, and 1 million subscribers. Find five creators at that level, write them down in a spreadsheet, okay? And then put that down or in a notebook, however you please. Then what you want to do is you want to find the average views per upload over their last 10 uploads. Only use, only use regular YouTube video uploads for this number. Not shorts, not live streams, regular YouTube videos. Go ahead and then figure out what that is. Then average the number of the videos per view of their last 10 uploads. Get the average. Plug that average in for each of those creators at those different levels and rinse and repeat this. This takes a lot of work. So do this on a Saturday or something. Do this on a Saturday or do this, wake up early in the morning before work and do this or do this after you get off your shift or do this on your lunch break. It's going to take a minute. It's going to take about 30, 45 minutes to complete this assignment. Okay. Um, if you don't know the creators in your niche very well, then it might take you two hours. So you fill out this thing. This is why I teach this. And this is what we do in the academy is we run through these things. So then once you've gotten the average numbers of views for each of these subscriber levels and you've picked five creators so that you can figure out kind of what the consistency of that is, then you average for that group as well. So you had it for the individual creators. Now you average for the group at their level. Now you have a baseline to say, okay, at this level, creators tend to get this. At this level, they tend to get this. At this level, they tend to get this. And that's like, okay, that's kind of normal. So you, now you know what the market looks like what the total adjustable market looks like and what its potential is. And then also, if you struggle to find creators at the higher levels of this in your uh, niche or for the type of content you want or for the type of content you want to make, then you know it's not that viable. You know it's not that viable if that many people cannot make high quality content that attracts a large audience. If, that, if not a lot of people can make the content you want to make and grow very large and you struggle to find more and more people at the 100K, 500K, and 1 million level, if the top three levels, you're struggling to find people that are in those that category and find five creators for each of those category levels. And if you're and if you're the views don't look great in terms of the average views over the last 10 uploads, then you know that that total addressable market may not be great and may not be financially viable. Now, if it is in a high income niche, because the thing you want to look at is how big is this market and then how profitable is this niche? If you want to know how profitable a niche is, you go and you watch my most profitable niches series on YouTube. I did multiple videos, most profitable niches in YouTube, most profitable videos to make. You go watch those and you find out what the most profitable niches can be and what they pay. And then you figure out, okay, that. The other thing you want to do is, hey, do people in these niches even get sponsorships and brand deals? And who are the sponsors? So you might want to do that. If your niche, if you can't find in the niche of content that you make, if you can't find 20 brands in the niche of content that you make, that have sponsored creators before. If you can't find 20 brands, 20 different companies, 20 different companies in that niche that have sponsored creators for high quality content, then you know that that niche is not good for brand deals. And you, if you were like, dang, I need to make money off brand deals, you might wanna reconsider because that niche, as much as you're passionate about it, may not be profitable. You don't wanna be a starving artist. So you have to figure out, the way that we figure out, hey, what niche are we gonna be in is, Total addressable market and profitability sits on the side of market fit, okay? So market fit is TAM, total addressable market and profitability. And profitability is how many monetization options do I have? And on a scale of one to five, 
how good is each of those monetization op options? This is what I teach. This is why people come to me for one-on-one -on -one coaching. This is why when people are dunking on me with the, about views and stuff like that, oh yeah, dunking me on views for not getting half a million views this month and everything like that. Well, I strive to get half a million dollars a year. Fantastic. So what you do is you look at total adjustable market and you look at profitability. Now, sometimes the total addressability, total addressable market is small, but the profitability is high and you don't need the total addressable market to be big. If it's an affluent market, it might be so profitable. And there also might be an underserved audience that's not being catered to because people are focused on the size instead of how much they spend. So there are people that there's a small group sometimes of high rollers that nobody is serving. So sometimes that's the answer. Sometimes there's a market of people that might be Gen X or boomers that are being underserved, or there might be career professionals that are being underserved because everyone's chasing the children behind Mr. Beast instead of serving the adults that make money. So there might be a thing there. So there, there's kind of a schism in the creator economy and YouTube of over 30 versus under 30. And guess which side of that I'm on? I'm on the over 30 side. So there is something that makes sense. Now, here's the thing. You know, if you figure out profitability of your market in terms of market fit and you figure out TAM, the other thing you have to do is say, what are my passion and my abilities and do my passions and my abilities, like, do I have the ability to deliver on the things that I'm passionate about? Am I actually good at those things? And then you have to figure out whether my passion and my abilities, which is basically your, let's say, capacity if my passion and my abilities, aka my capacity, also aligns with the market fit that I'm looking at, then I have a really good niche because it's the intersectionality of I'm passionate about these things, I'm good at these things, there's a demand and need and market for it, and it's profitable. That intersectionality is what we call ikigai. If you've aligned those things properly, that's the right niche for you to be in. It makes no sense to do something you're passionate about and then not deliver value or be bad at it and suck at it. It makes no sense to be good at, be passionate about it, good at it, and be broke. It makes no sense to be passionate about it, good at it, and then there's no audience for it. So that's why you have to align your capacity to market fit. My passion and my skills. So that's your capacity. That's your ability. My passion and my skills. So that's my ability, and here's the market that it can serve. Ability plus market fit equals niche. Savvy? We get it. Ability, which is my passion and skills, my abilities. Market fit is TAM and profitability. They marry together. That's our niche. It's a match made in heaven. Swipe right. So, again, that's why I teach people. Is coaching something you would suggest for someone with below 1K subs and only 20 available hours a week? If you're below 1K subs and 20 available hours a week, my recommendation is typically to go through all of my free content, all of my free content, all of my free resources, use the strategies that I tell you to go to 100K, get yourself monetized, and after you're at, sorry, not 100K, go to 1,000 subscribers, get yourself monetized, and then come into the academy. The only exception I really make for that is if you have a business or you're a high income earner, that it makes sense because for you, time is more valuable than money in that play. That makes sense. But if you're doing something else, maybe you're in the entertainment niche, something like that. If you're under 1K, use my tips to get to the 1K, get yourself monetized, and then come back to me. Do not spend money with me until you're in a position to make money. And so that's why I ask you to go ahead and at least get yourself monetized, use my free content. Use my free content, get monetized. Once you get monetized, it makes sense to work with me and my team. The exception is someone who's already in business or is already a career professional at a higher level. Hi, Haley. Met you at Vid Summit. Are you aware of any creators making money selling customized audio downloads? Um... 
Not particularly, but that's really interesting. I am aware of creators that make money in the ASMR niche. I'm, crea- I'm aware of creators making money in music downloads and streaming. I'm aware of creators making money in voice acting and voiceover for audio licensing and licensing their voice and getting royalty money through ACX and Audible. And I'm aware of people who are making money doing question and answer stuff on Minect, which is owned by Patrick Bet David and Valuetainment. But selling customized audio downloads is not something I've seen or heard of a lot of people making money on, but it is an interesting idea. And I'd like to revisit that sometime. That is an interesting idea. If you haven't, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up on the video. If you haven't done that already, we really appreciate it when you guys do that. And also, if you have not already, remember to download the 12-week creator playbook. It is linked in the description down below. You definitely want to get that. I'm going to drop it here in the chat for you. You absolutely want to get this free creator playbook. It also gets you on my newsletter. My newsletter is called Creator Economy Insider. I am your insider. So we're dropping that in the chat, and we also have that at the top of the description here. We're going to make sure it finds its way into the info card on YouTube to make that easy for people. Um, But you will absolutely want to get that free playbook. Let's see. So make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're hitting the uh, hitting the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, Opus Clip is Opus Clip is its own tool. Opus Clip is its own tool, and ultimately, you can go ahead and get it. It's not a download tool; it's a browser-based tool. Streamyard and Opus Clip are both browser-based, so you're not going to find it in the App Store if you're looking for it in the App Store. And there we go. Let's see. Thank you for all the wonderful comments here. And like I said, yeah, this is why I use StreamYard. This is why I multi-stream. Someone might be following me on x.com slash Twitter, not get the YouTube alerts, but they'll see me on X and then they'll come on over. So again, this is how you use the strategy. Lazarus React says, do you think anime reaction content is saturated? I think that low quality, low effort anime reaction is saturated. I do not think that people doing what CJ the Champ and Sensei are doing is saturated. And that's the high level version of reaction and review content. So I would just go high effort. I never worry about saturation. Do you know why I never worry about saturation? Um, I think I have a slide for this. I think I have a slide for this somewhere. No, that's my Kaizen slide. Uh, I need to do a slide for this later. Um, that's a standalone slide. But basically, I don't believe at all in worrying about whether a niche is saturated because everything in YouTube is only saturated with one thing. There's only one thing saturated in YouTube. Low effort, low quality, low value content that is delivered by inconsistent creators. That's the only thing that is abundant and saturated in YouTube is low quality content. And do you know why I know that? Because less than 1% of creators have ever gotten a silver play button. And because less than 10% of creators have ever gotten 10,000 subscribers, which means that most people are not making content that is good enough for the audience to want to support it. And 88% of videos in YouTube never get 1,000 views. So if you break 1,000 views, you're in the top 10% of YouTube by that. If you break a thousand views, if you break 10,000 subscribers, you're in the top 10% of YouTube. The bar is low. The bar is low. It can't get lower. And shorts has lowered the bar even further for people. So at this point, there's not some embarrassment of riches of great content because every single one of you, if I name a type of video or a niche in YouTube, you will struggle to name 10 creators making high quality content off the top of your head. And that means that there ain't that many of them. 
and that you're not watching them and they haven't earned your attention yet. So the answer to your question is I don't to answer it to anyone who ever asks me, do I think anything is saturated? And the answer is no, it is saturated with crap. It is saturated with low hanging fruit, et cetera. By the way, some of that crap is justified because some of it is justified. The fact it's saturated with brand new creators who have no free time to make content. So they're not capable of making anything good enough yet, which is also okay. The majority of people on YouTube have not been making content for even a year. They haven't made their first 100 videos. Majority of people give up before they make their first 100 videos. It is rare for anyone to make good content without making 100 videos first. You know how I know that? PewDiePie made 100 videos. He only got 2,500 subscribers. Go watch his first 100 video special. Mr. Beast 100 video, um, he got less than 800 subscribers. He couldn't even get monetized if he wanted to. Uh, for his first 100 videos. Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD, he has like 17 million subscribers now. He got 78 subscribers for his first 100 videos in YouTube and was happy about it. I go and I find the 100 video upload celebration for uh, YouTubers, and then I find out how many videos they made to get that, and then I look at how many videos they've made since. I look at how many subscribers they have now. The overwhelming majority of YouTubers who have made it made 500 to 1,500 videos in their career over the course of, on average, seven plus years. The average is they make 100 to 150 videos a year. They upload two to three times a week at some point when they're able to. Most of them start very young or they start as young adults. So most YouTubers start between the ages of 13 and 20. There's an outlier of us professionals who start in our late 20s or early 30s and up, but the majority of them is that. I've used the data from Social Blade. I pay for a $50 version of the account. I pay $50 a month to get advanced reports from Social Blade. I analyzed the top 1,000 creators in every category vertical in YouTube. I did an average of the number of uploads and the average of the number of years that their account has been active. And the numbers came back. And the average minimum number of uploads across every single vertical basically come up came out to around roughly for every vertical. When you average across all 14 of them, roughly about 500 videos minimum for the top 1,000 creators in every 14 of the category verticals in YouTube. And then the average age duration of their accounts was at least around seven years. So if you ever wondered what YouTube success looks like, it's called make 500 to 1,500 videos over the course of seven to 10 years. By the way, that's exactly what making any career go to six figures would look like. That's what getting a business or a startup to six to seven figures looks like too. Building a successful business, building a successful personal brand, building a successful career, getting the highest achievements and awards in academia, it's all the same. Seven to 10 years, minimum of five for the exceptional and privileged and elite and geniuses and talented God-given gifts of people, five minimum buy-in. Most people, 500 to 1,000 executions at their craft over the course of seven to 10 years. That's what it looks like. There are unicorns who do it in less than 100 videos. There are unicorns who do it in less than a year. There are unicorns who do it in less than three years, but that's not the majority. It's not the mean. It's not the median. The numbers are the numbers, and they are harsh, but... The difference is not about it being the statistical outlier probability. It's not a question of probability of you being a successful content creator. It's a matter of qualifications that disqualify you, meaning that the majority of people cannot get this thing because they do not meet the requirements. So if you start to think about it the way you would think about the military or about athletics, right? If the athletics thing said, hey, most people don't qualify for this because to meet the requirement, one of our standards is you have to have like less than 15% body fat to be athletic enough to do this thing. On average, you'd need less than 15% body fat. Well, guess what? That would disqualify more than 95% of the population of any given population. So, okay, that would mean you're not fit enough. Uh, requirements for military PT depend on your age, right? So you have to do X amount of push-ups, sit-ups, push-ups, crunches, um, pull-ups in 60 seconds, to meet the physical requirements for the PT standard. You have to be able to run a mile in a certain threshold based on your age. Well, with YouTube, yes, there's subscriber milestone things, but to even be capable of doing the thing to get the subscribers, you'd have to be capable to do that. And to do that, there's requirements. Most people cannot make it because making it usually requires a lot of time. And most people don't have the time, energy, or resources. So <clears throat> for making quality content, is usually four things that let you make quality content. 
time freedom. Most of you, you only have 10 to 20 extra hours a week like the other person was talking about, 10 to 20 extra hours a week of free time. That makes it very hard to compete with the market of people who can spend 40 hours or also who can have a team and spend 40 hours of someone else's time on top of it. So you're already disadvantaged on time freedom if you're a working class creator. Number two, if you're a working class creator, how much uh, spare investment capital do you have to put into your channel? Do you have the ability to put a thousand dollars a year into your channel to get your camera equipment going, get your lights, get your microphone. Oh, you don't, you're just using your phone. You can, but majority of the best content on YouTube getting views was not made by a phone. I'm excluding YouTube shorts from that conversation. So guess what? Now you're competing with less investment capital for resources. So you're competing now with people who already have resources. That's rough. You can, it does happen. I'm not saying no one ever gets views without studio resources, lights or anything. I'm saying, let's look at the views you think you want. Let's look at those outlier views. And let's remember that 88% of people never get a thousand views on YouTube on their videos. 88% of videos on YouTube for the last 18 years have never cleared a thousand views. So if that's true, and we're excluding shorts from that, if that's true, because again, shorts does not matter in this conversation. It does not really serve a, fun, a purpose other than inflating views and subscribers. It does not. So we're not counting it. Um, sorry. But so when we're talking about regular YouTube videos in this equation, then, okay, we don't have the investment capital to compete at the beginning. Okay, fine. Fair enough. What about manpower? Most of you don't have friends and family who can help you. Successful creators often have someone who can help with something, even if it's just someone holding a camera, like I talked about with my brother, just someone holding another camera so you can get a different shot, different angle, something to make up for maybe not having the capital, not having a slider, not having a second camera angle, like someone just holding an extra camera or smartphone or walking around with you for five minutes where you get the shot, whatever, take the shot for your thumbnail. You don't have the extra manpower. Successful creators often have at least one person. They actually have an editor or a thumbnail artist, something, freelancer, someone to hold a camera, something. Okay. And then there's experience, education, expertise. So people who are older sometimes win on expertise because they can be a lawyer, a doctor, a graphic designer, something professional and have credibility and bring social proof through expertise to the platform. So then they can win, right? Or someone had an education background like Peter McKinnon, where it's like, oh, I worked at the job. I was a, a photographer, so I have expertise and I was educated on how to do these things. So I have skill. So now I have to learn everything from scratch. So they have an advantage on speed. So they need less time to get things up because they at least have their education in their background. Or they have experience. There are people who grow on YouTube and you don't realize that they have an advantage because they have nepotism. They were trained by a big YouTuber. They worked behind the scenes for years for a channel. They worked at BuzzFeed. They worked at another media company. They worked at Vox, Vice, BuzzFeed, something, something in the creator economy. They worked it for you know TubeBuddy or VidIQ or whatever. So like they might have the experience in the industry, whether it's the experience in the back end of content creation, working for a platform, working for another creator, working for a media company, working for a camera company. So they have this advantage. And again, someone from corporate, they'll have their experience as leverage and social proof possibly. Uh, so they'll have expertise. Someone can be educated about technology and that might be an advantage. And then somebody might have experience in content creation from another thing. And so that's the E. So the acronym spells time, time, freedom, investment, capital, manpower, experience, expertise, education. So the thing is, if you don't have time, it's hard to compete. The market is saturated with people who don't have the leverage of those four things. They don't have the leverage of time. The market's saturated with that which means they produce a lower quality product and experience for the viewer. So they are able to deliver not as high effort because they don't really have the time freedom and the resources for the high effort. They don't have the you know experience, background, education to package it up to make the value proposition right with title, topic, thumbnail, because they don't have experience and expertise. Um, they don't have the manpower to get the quality up. And sometimes they don't have the education, experience, expertise to get the quality up either. And because they lack the time freedom, they can't be consistent. So all of those things work against a smaller creator. So when you think that you're dealing with the practice, oh, my thing is saturated, my niche is saturated, 
No, your niche isn't saturated. You don't qualify to be a top tier creator because you have deficits in these four areas that have to be addressed. If you address the deficits in these four areas, the content improves, the experience improves, the value to the viewer improves, and you have the capacity to deliver more consistently, high quality, high effort, harder to duplicate content. And if you can make hard to duplicate content, high effort and high quality, and you can package it better than anybody else, high value, okay? And then you can deliver it consistently and not just upload frequently, but consistent levels of quality, consistent levels of value, keeping your promises. Then you can do something most people can't do. And that's not saturated. So being at the high level, is not saturated. So the thing is, that's what looking like 1% comes in. That's where looking like a 1%er comes in. And you have to look like a 1%er to be a 1%er. And it's not fake it till you make it. It's that you have to have the characteristics of a 1%er to become a 1%er. That can be earned. You can grind your way and struggle bust your way to breaking through to the top 10% of YouTube because all that is is being monetized, having 10,000 subscribers, and getting over 1,000 views per upload. That is all it takes to be in the top 10% of YouTube. The bar is that low. It is that difficult. It is that difficult. All you have to achieve to be in the top 10% of YouTube is 1,000 views for every upload on average, 10,000 subscribers for your account and have your account monetized. And if you do that, 90% of creators do not have any of those things. In each of those categories, 90% of creators come up short. Less than 10% of creators are in the partner program. That's a fact, globally, worldwide. Some of it is that your country doesn't participate in the partner program. Um, less than 10% of creators have 10,000 subscribers. And less than 10% of videos on the platform get over 1,000 views. So if you can accomplish those three things, you are a top 10% creator. The bar is that low. But being a 1% creator is a whole nother matter. Being a top 1% creator is when you're getting over 10,000 views. It's having, you know, being a 1% creator is over 100K subscribers, over 10,000 views, and making on average to be a 1% creator, um, you'd have to be making about $50,000 a year. Not joking. Not joking. That's the levels. World according to Briggs. Good seeing you here. It was also good seeing you at Vid Summit. You have been helping me for a long time. Yep, appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, World According to Briggs is a huge channel, by the way. You guys should check them out. Not broke, just spreading, just bought the creator prompts. Nice. Hope it delivers for you. Yesterday, I recommended your last live stream to a coworker. Could I get a referral code to sell your products? Um, there are qualifications and there's an application process to being uh, one of my affiliates. But I do appreciate the shout out. So I report you have 30,000 emails. Uh, yeah, let's talk about you doing a newsletter. You need to. Frugal BC says, I have a local newsletter and it's the biggest source of income outside of my day job. Substack is great for monetization. Yeah, it can be. It can be. I like ConvertKit because I like owning every aspect of my newsletter and the database being able to transfer with me easily. So that's why I like ConvertKit because I want to own the database. What is the best newsletter funnel? Actually, so there's a couple of them. If you want to grow your newsletter so that you're not a digital sharecropper and you own the relationship with your audience and you have that access, what I recommend in that situation is this. Um, having a freebie like my 12-week uh, creator playbook is really good. So having a really good freebie, and that could be a download, it could be an infographic, it could be whatever. So having a freebie, that's a good one. Having a landing page that's just about the value of your newsletter and what you have to offer is a good funnel. Having a video sales letter to your community about your freebie on your YouTube channel and having a video on your YouTube channel about your freebie and staging it as a regular video, not a, hey, join my newsletter. It's like, hey, how to do this? And then explaining that your newsletter freebie can help them do the, the thing that you're saying. Um, so then that becomes the centerpiece of that. The other thing you do is if you have a YouTube channel, in your info card for your YouTube channel, at the 10 second mark in every YouTube video, go ahead and put an info card with the link to your freebie 
for your newsletter or just to promote your newsletter, make a custom graphic for it in a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. So 1500 by 1500 or 1000 by 1000 as far as a, a graphic. And you make that graphic, you do that in the YouTube info card, you link to your, um, your landing page or sign up for your newsletter, you do that. That will then, I'll do a video about this, don't worry. We'll do a live stream about growing your newsletter. We'll do a dedicated live stream very soon this year about growing your newsletter. And so you do that, and then that will help you promote and grow your newsletter. The other thing you do is you make a graphic, again, a square one by one graphic, a thousand by a thousand pixels. You promote that weekly in your YouTube community tab weekly. You schedule it out, you promote it weekly, and you get people to sign up for it uh, for free. You make a cool graphic for it. Mine is me hugging my YouTube play button and saying 12 week free creator playbook. And then people immediately notice, oh, YouTube play button. And they read what it is. And then they go, okay, cool. I'll, I'll check that out. The other thing I do is I make it the pinned comment most of the time on my other community tab posts. So I try to do nearly daily community tab posts with um, polls. I do polls, I do quizzes sometimes, I'll do text post, I'll do image post, and then make it the pinned comment of, hey, don't forget to get the free um, creator playbook, 12 weeks, blah, 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 totally free. Sign up for the newsletter, blah, blah, blah. So then that's also my lead generation and my lead funnel there. The other thing you could do is if you're in a education-based niche, it looks like you're in design, do some kind of free one hour or 90 minute or two hour webinar. It'll be comparable to a course for people. Um, it could be really dope do that, but they only get access to that recorded webinar if they sign up their email. And you can set that up and you can do a webinar using StreamYard. You can either do it recorded or you can do it live. And then you could post the recording and you could do all of that with StreamYard with their on-air feature for webinars if you have the paid version of StreamYard. So I would do that. Um, and that can be a really good funnel as well. So basically you can do um, info cards in YouTube, community tab in YouTube to promote. You can do video sales letter in, new in YouTube. You can do a webinar on your own website platform and landing page. And also you can um, do swipe up post in uh, Instagram. You could also make an Instagram highlight your freebie and your newsletter to get people to do that. So that's an evergreen hack for you for that. So you could do that with an Instagram story that you turn into an Instagram highlight for people to get your newsletter. So you could take that approach to it as well. You could do um, daily Instagram stories and at the um, midpoint of your stories, remind people to get your freebie. And um, it's not a swipe up, by the way, it's a click on the uh, sticker now, it's a clickable sticker now. So then you do that in Instagram daily, promote there, boom, boom, boom. You could also create a video and you could run a boosted post as a video for Instagram to promote your newsletter if you wanted to do that. Um, so those are just options for how to grow your newsletter across all your social media platforms. Um, at some point, actually, I know what I'm going to do. Like, So that's the kind of thing. When I do the course, the Profitable Personal Brand, one of the things I'll talk about is how to grow your email list to 10,000. And I'm going to do um, something to help you get your first hundred or your first thousand emails here as like some free workshop on the live streams. We'll do that sometime uh, in the first quarter of the year here. But the I'm going to definitely do a whole thing on the course for that in the personal branding course. I'll also do the automation for here's how you make the evergreen newsletter. Here's the automation for that. Here's why I use ConvertKit to do it. So there'll be evergreen newsletter so that your email list never goes cold so that you have emails going out one to two times a month. One should be a purely evergreen email that's purely information and value. One promo a month. So that's your two a month and your evergreen. And I'll tell you how to set up that system. Then you write your emails on top of that. But if you ever just can't, it means that in a month, people still got two emails from you. So that's good. We'll talk about making your freebie lead magnets. We'll talk about <clears throat> making your landing page. You know, it would be all those things. So, so that's how we do it. Um, let's see. Which platform is the best for building email list? Uh, we actually talked about that earlier. And uh, for reference, uh, I use Kajabi, not Kajabi, I use uh, ConvertKit. Now I do also use um, Kajabi for the business side and I have, it does have an all-in-one for emails with Kajabi if you wanted to do it that way. But for dedicated email list, because ConvertKit also has a sponsorship network. Once you get to 10,000 email subscribers, 
Uh, ConvertKit has a built-in sponsorship platform for sponsors to find you. So that's the other reason I use ConvertKit. And I told you that you can um, get sponsors for your newsletter and they can pay thousands of dollars if you have a solid newsletter, just like with your YouTube channel, your Instagram, your TikTok, but you own your newsletter and you control that. The reason I love ConvertKit is I like their tools. I like the CEO. Um, I think it's great. But one of the big reasons is there is a couple of things in it. They have a creator network where other people can add you as a recommendation, like how YouTube has recommendations, and you can grow your newsletter off of other people in the network recommending you. So, so now you don't even have to fully grow your email list from scratch because you can be recommended by other people. So that's one reason I use it. The other reason is if you grow the email list big enough, there's a sponsorship network so you can get brand deals built in right there because they have a sponsorship network. So that's one of the other reasons. I'm also, I know the CEO, Nathan Barry, I've interviewed him on my podcast. If you guys have um, done the audio podcast and you've heard that interview um, and how he grew a uh, convert kit to a $30 million a year company from nothing from a side hustle. Um, so here's the thing. I am trying right now in x.com, formerly Twitter, to talk Nathan Barry, the CEO of ConvertKit, into giving creator awards to anyone who gets 10,000 email signups in their uh, email newsletter and a big trophy like YouTube. If you get 100,000 people signed up to your newsletter, I am trying actively to do that as we speak right now. And they are taking it seriously. I got some replies back. They're taking it seriously. Even their main competitor, Beehive, is now like, hey, maybe we should do that. Like, So I got some traction on getting us some more physical awards because I think every thing should just do physical awards for people who are successful and that will draw more people into the creator economy because i think youtube's one of youtube's big draws is the silver and gold play buttons those silver go and play gold play button awards i mean if you can't see it because like i um i'll adjust my camera here so that you guys can see it i'm gonna have to turn up my brightness if i turn up my aperture so i'm gonna turn up my brightness it's gonna blow me out a little until i do this so i'm gonna adjust my aperture a little bit so if you look behind me, you can see my uh, old school silver play button and you can see my new school uh, silver play button there. Um, I'd have to turn up my brightness more. Uh, that's about as high as that'll go. But that's just so you can see the awards. Now I'm going to turn that back down to wait. I'm going to turn that back down to my blurry background there. There we go. That's nice. So, yeah, but. My creator awards are in the background there. And I think that if there are creator awards for growing your email newsletter, more people will do it. So I'm trying to get physical awards for people growing their email newsletter. I'm trying to get ConvertKit to do that. Beehive might do it as well. But I'm trying to push for that because I want to encourage people. It's wildly profitable and practical to grow your email list. But if you just get a bloody physical trophy for doing it, I know you'll actually do it. So that's a whole thing that I'm trying to get going there. So I'm out here talking to the creator economy CEOs. I'm trying to get them to do things. We're trying to make some moves out here. Um, let's see. Deep Soul Tarot says, you have such an incredible business mind and it's so relatable how you explain the strategies. It's easy to understand. I've been following for a long time, so I appreciate what you, thank you. It's really sweet. I appreciate that. Uncle Jovison says, is Awesome Creator Academy something you would recommend for someone under 1K? Um, oh, I talked about that already. Appreciate you. Mr. Elmore's Music Lab says, hey, Roberto, I have a whole place list of videos that I made about four months ago getting a bunch of views right now. What exactly causes this in the algorithm? Thank you so much. So I actually had this happen to me. My biggest video with over a million views did not start out that way. I was one of the early people to making videos about passive income on YouTube. I made this video in 2016. It's my most successful video of all time. At the time, there was almost no video in English that was getting a lot of views on passive income. Mine was one of the first ones to get 100,000 views back in the day. This is back in my day, back in the olden days. So back in 2016, most people, they could not clear 100,000 views on the passive income topic. It was very rare for them to do that. 
And I was a big fan and becoming a friend of Pat Flynn, who did his podcast called Smart Passive Income. I was successfully making passive income, so I started talking about it on my channel. So I started getting views on that, and I got to like 100,000 views. Now, what happened and what took that to a million views was after I did that, months later, many, many, many months later, it started to shoot up started to shoot up because other people started making videos about passive income and they started doing really well. People started making decent videos about it. People started making honest videos about it. And then I was in the suggested algorithm because my video was already successful and now they needed to find more people talking about this. And at the time it wasn't that many people, but I was there and I was the first recommended and I was the better thumbnail and the better video every single time. And in fact, I ended up being number one when anyone searched passive income. And I stayed in the number one spot for about two years for anyone searching passive income on YouTube, I stayed in the number one spot in search for two years on that topic. And that carried me to 1.4 million views on that video. Sometimes what will happen is your video will not be hot at the time. But if other people make videos and you're suggested against those videos, a high tide raises all ships. High tide raises all ships. So sometimes... This is not about the out. You have to remember the algorithm does follow the audience. The algorithm is a fancy way of saying, here's all the analytics data that we measured on how the audience is behaving. The algorithm cannot make something happen. The algorithm responds to what is happening already. You need to understand that the algorithm doesn't make anything happen any more than iOS or Mac OS makes anything happen. iOS makes something happen because of what I'm putting into my keyboard and what other things are happening in the world. It is only a reaction. The YouTube algorithm is reactionary. It's not preemptive. The YouTube algorithm, now the monetization algorithm can be preemptive. The demonetization algorithm can be preemptive. The things that throttle or censor can be preemptive, but the but that's even somewhat reactionary because that actually happens in real time. It's, it's, it's real time because sometimes... If a topic becomes toxic in real time, it wouldn't have gotten flagged before, but it will then. And then in two more weeks, it might not get flagged because it's not toxic anymore. But what you have to understand is YouTube is a uh, responsive system. It is not making things happen on its own. It is reacting to things as they're happening and then doing something about it. So the thing is, if something is trending organically, YouTube will also hop on the trend and will push it more. So if something is popping, YouTube's like, hey, there's demand. Do I have enough supply? What do I have in the back? Let me serve it up. All right, I got to move this product. I got to get to whatever I got that's even closely related. I got to shove it out the door because there's demand now. That's what happens. Y'all need to understand that YouTube is supply and demand economics 101. If there is demand, YouTube will find supply. If you already have inventory, YouTube pushes you if there's a demand and you're the only one or the main one with inventory or you have the best inventory, YouTube will push you when there's demand. So if demand changes and you have supply on hand, it's like, hey, how much product do you got? I need to move it. All right, well, give me that. So then you become the distributor. Like, you know, like, or rather YouTube's the distributor, you're the supplier. You have to think of that relationship. YouTube is a distributor, you're a supplier. You're a manufacturer of content. YouTube is a distributor of content. So the thing is, in that relationship, nothing can happen without demand. YouTube is merely a distributor. So YouTube is beholden to demand. You have to make product that wants to be moved. You have to make product that can be moved. The distributor isn't going to come to you if no one wants your product. If no one wants your product, the distributor can't move it if it tried. If you make something and nobody wants it, YouTube could give you a billion impressions and it would not matter. If YouTube YouTube could give most of y'all a billion impressions and you won't go viral because people are not going to buy what you're selling. So you're not going to be viable to the distributor because the either the market doesn't want the product, isn't aware of the product, doesn't have a good product fit, or the product itself is not good. Sometimes a product can be good, but there's no market for it. So it's not worth the effort for a distributor because, hey, I can't move that enough. There's not a big enough total addressable market to move your product to. Your product category is too small, even if you have a very good product. Your product category is too small to make the effort for me to work harder as the distributor. There are easier things for me to sell with less effort. So I'm going to move that more because there's just it's easier. Your thing is good, but it's not as big. 
So I'm just going to focus on what you know can bring me more. So the distributor goes that way. That's why someone can make the best educational video in the world and they will not get Mr. Beast views because entertainment is a bigger total addressable market than education. Education is a more valuable market. So the distributor is like, I don't need to move as much volume to make as much money on your thing. That's why a gaming channel might get a $2 RPM, but an education channel will get a $10 or $12 RPM. And the thing is, oh, I you can move less volume on education but get more money. So it's like, okay, I don't have to work as hard to get that money. But then on gaming, it's like, oh, man, if we don't get distribution on this, it's not worth it. So, so that, that I hope that answers your question. I hope it answers the bigger meta question for people of how YouTube works. The bigger meta question of how YouTube works is you have to consider it entirely in the terms of supply and demand economics. Look at YouTube as what it is, a distributor. Look at it as a distributor and all of us are suppliers. And then there's only the market. Distributors and suppliers both serve the market. When we do not serve the market, if we cannot, if our product is not something that people are beating down the doors for, the distributor cannot change the demand of the market. The distributor cannot alter the demands in the market. Now, there are things and forces that can. There are, there are forces that can create demand in the market. But it's not going to happen because of the distributor. It's going to happen because of usually a function of either organically in the market or through media, propaganda, trends, culture shifts, culture shifts. It's going to be some outside force that influences increase in market uh, demand. And then as a supplier, fantastic. But the other thing is sometimes a great product itself can then create and manifest demand. A disruptive product can manifest demand. So you see what I'm saying? A distributor is only doing fulfillment, though. A distributor is only doing fulfillment. That's YouTube's responsibility. YouTube's responsibility is fulfillment. If you have not pressed like yet, do it. Do it now. Execute order 66. Execute order 66. Yeah, like hit the like button. Hit the like button. Don't do it for me. Do it for Emperor Palpatine. Do it for the glorious empire. <laughs> so, yeah. So we have another niche question. My niche is competitive street fighter. What are some ways I can provide value to my community to generate income and gain super fans outside of being dominant at every tournament I go to? Okay, fantastic. I am an old school uh, Marvel versus Capcom, Marvel versus SNK, uh, Marvel versus street fighter guy. Okay. So, and rival schools also. So, and um, all that stuff. So what I would say in your situation is I would um, do potentially some videos that are about, to some degree, challenges, like doing um, an infinite air combo with every character. So I would do a video where it's like doing an inf doing a uh, juggle, like how to juggle with like these, like with this character, like how to juggle like with this character, how to do an infinite air combo with this um, character, um, challenge, um, going, um, you know, do it, um, perfect 100% with every character in street fighter six, or are we on five or six? I forget now we're on five now, right? We're on street fighter five now. Or are we on street fighter six? I forget. I forget. Cause I'm casual now. I'm casual now. So I've got, okay. So like literally I'd do a challenge video. It's like, without going to the tournament, I'd be going like, okay, um, get it like, yeah, going, uh, 100% perfect with every character in street fighter six or whatever, right? That's a video that any street fighter player, even a filthy casual like me will click on to see if you can actually do it and to see like what it takes to do that. Now that's a hard video to make. And that's why that would be a viral video idea. You know, that'd be a viral video idea and everyone will watch it because that is a really damn hard video to make on pure effort that is what we call high effort content that is high effort content and it is almost non-duplicatable because of the skill level required the skill level required so like all right going perfect it's like okay now here's the other one it's like the skill level required to do like a okay doing a um 
doing the highest like and then you'd figure out the number is you figure out the number and you go all right the highest number of combos possible that you can do with any one character and then you do that number and you're doing doing a blah 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 doing a 35 hit combo with akuma like you know it's like and then you show people how to do it you do a doing a um 26 hit air juggle with cami and then you do it if that's possible, if it's possible to do it, but you find out what the maximum threshold or limit of a, of a high effort video can be and you execute on it. And so it's, you would come up with, if it was me, I would come up with like 10 or 20 theoretically like impossible ideas. And because you have all these different characters in the series, you might be able to apply this and make this a series. You might be able to make viral video after viral video after viral video um, doing that. Um, and one of the reasons I know this works in gaming, by the way, is there was a small YouTuber. He's not small anymore, not that small, but he would go viral doing this with the Hitman series. His name is Onion Butter. His name is Onion Butter, and he would do this with um, the Hitman series. He did a video, and then people started copying him. He uh, did, all right, I can beat Hitman with with zero, without killing anybody. I can beat Hitman without killing anybody. So he did, so the thumbnail for that was the Hitman character with a halo over his head and the pearly gates of heaven in the background. And then in red text, it said zero kills. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to beat Hitman and I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm going to show you how I can do that. And it was a really good video. It was a fun video, funny video. Even if you're not going to play Hitman, you'd watch the video. And so boom, um, got like, got tons of views on that as a small YouTuber with no subscribers. He was able to do that. Uh, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, um, a Pokemon gamer called Enter the Unknown did this with doing videos like, oh, can you beat Pokemon with Ash's original team? Can you beat Pokemon without using items? Can you make can you beat Pokemon with only gifted Pokemon? Like they created interesting challenges for themselves for every scenario and made it um, something to watch that you could watch for nostalgia or spectacle. So Saif711 uh, says, $10 super chat. Roberto, question. Thank you for the previous answer. What do you think about promoting YouTube videos on X Twitter? I'm sensing that triggers the YouTube algorithm, even if the content promoted is good, of course. Um, I would make your audience aware of content you're making, but I wouldn't necessarily link to it, push it that way. I, it doesn't do nearly as much. A view is a view. If you're small, if you're small, a view is a view, but it's not going to trigger the algorithm. So uh, if that was your goal for doing it, then no, but if you're just trying to get another couple of views, a view is a view. So sure. Same thing. If someone, if your video got big because of Reddit, a view is a view that by itself won't trigger the algorithm. But if enough people are watching and interesting on something, then it's in their uh, previous watch history. Other people like them, if it's enough, people start to find it. So again, a lot of people say organic YouTube, organic YouTube, organic. But my thing is, it's not about triggering the algorithm. A view is a view. A view is a view, and a view is performance data. It's better if that view is all in the YouTube ecosystem in theory, but a view is a view. So um, I look at it, and I also care more about brand. I do not care about the YouTube algorithm. Most of you should stop caring about the YouTube algorithm. What I care about is what's the total addressable market, how profitable is my niche, what are my uh, skills, and what are my passions that I can speak authentically about, and I'm only caring about that. I'm going to be in alignment with my audience. Here is my abilities. Here's the alignment with the audience. Here's that with the brands. I do not care about the YouTube algorithm. I only care about helping you build a reputation that can demand attention, okay? So you build a, a reputation that demands attention. That means get good at something. Get good, scrub. Get good at something. So I help you get good at something. We need skills to do that so that people we can demonstrate our value to people. So here's skills. Then for reach, we're going to make a content strategy that gets this reach. That content strategy is I'm going to know my audience better than anyone. I'm going to psychoanalyze my audience. I will know them better than anybody. I will know what their life is like. I will know the ins and out. I will know their income bracket. I will know their this. I will know where they live. I will know everything I can about the market. I will study the market. I will study my niche. I will study what works. I will study the masters. I will study people at a thousand subs. I'll study people at 10,000 subs. I will study the people at 150,000 subs, 100,000 subs, uh, uh, 500,000 and a million subscribers. In fact, what I will do is at every one of those six levels, I will go and find uh, creators. I'll find like five, 10 creators, and then I will download the thumbnails next to their name of the last 10 videos or the videos that they made that got um, the best views or their most popular videos. I'll download the thumbnails of those popular videos at every single level for those creators or the last 10 even. And I'll say, this is the standard 
of the market of the most popular video that creator at this level can get out of all these creators that I looked at five creators, at every level. This is me downloading hundreds of thumbnails. This is why I teach you. If you want to do this, if you want to get reach, this is why I teach you because remember getting views is about your value. Value is packaging value for the viewer is how you get views and what's value topic, title, thumbnail, and timing. So what do I do? I find creators, a thousand subscribers in my niche, 10,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand, 500,000, a million. I find a couple of different creators at that level, maybe three, maybe five. I go and I find their 10 most popular videos and I look at the title of those videos and I look at the thumbnail of those videos for each of these levels. And I look at and put the number of views next to that. And then I go, okay, this is the proof of what the market wants and how big the total adjustable market is and what they want. This is proof of demand. And this is what people supplied to fulfill that demand and to be valued. So this is the value that the viewer wants. This is exactly what they want. It's not debatable once you have that. This ends up being hundreds of thumbnails that you end up putting on a, a, a document, by the way. This is not for the faint of heart. This is me being extreme. This is why I teach, I, and this is the extreme. This is the crazy radical strategy that I use. So then when I'm teaching other creators, my market, I don't have to go this far from my market because I helped build my niche. I helped build my niche, so I don't have to worry about it. But if I'm doing something in a different category, and I've done this with a lot of people, this is how we address it. Now, most of what I do is I help people figure out the money, the brand deal side and everything. But for this side, oh yeah, I was a graphic designer and I was a marketer and I worked in advertising. So I know all about the supply and demand side of this. So what we do is we build this big old document and we see this. Now we know that every thumbnail we make has to be competitive with the people at our level or higher. So then we do whatever it takes. That's one of a couple of things. That means we either learn how to make better thumbnails ourselves, we get good scrub, or we hire somebody. So we do that. So now our thumbnail problem is solved. Now we look at the titles and topics that the people in our niche chose. We're not going to copy them. We're going to learn from them. We're going to take inspiration. We're going to say... We can learn from everybody at every level uh, based on their most popular thing. So based on the most popular thing, we could figure out a topic trend that seems to be popular. And then we could start saying, okay, these are the topics that seem to be popular. These are the things that most of the people in my market care about the most. How can I build a content strategy where I build six content pillars that allow me to make content about the things that they care about the most? Okay, great. Now I need to build title strategies now that I have my topics and my content pillars, I've built out the strategy of my content pillars. Now I need to fulfill those pillars. How am I going to make 100 videos across these six topic ideas, these six things that they care about, these six topics that they care about, these six pillars that they care about, the six things my community cares about, okay? Now, for the six things my community cares about or the five things they really care about deeply, I have to figure out how I'm going to make 20 videos about each of those things this year. And so the thing is, I don't necessarily need 20 ideas for each of those things per se. I don't necessarily need a hundred unique video ideas. I might actually only need two or three ideas for each pillar. And then I could turn those two or three ideas into a series of videos or at a bare minimum, a trilogy. If an idea is good, it's worth doing a trilogy. If that's good, it's worth doing six videos about it and making a series of five or six video mini series. So if it's a good idea, it's worth at least doing a trilogy. If it's if the trilogy performs, it's worth at least doing a mini series now. So we do that across our our uh, our pillars, and now we've got our hundred videos. And then we measure the best twenty percent of results, and then we say the twenty best videos were this. Now we're gonna normalize that and 80% of all of our content next year will be based on the best 20 videos we ever did. And we will normalize our top 20% of videos that produced 80% of our results. We will make that now 80% of the content that we make and that is how we will exponentially scale our results. And we will do that once again by saying, here are the 20 outlier videos. Now based on those, I will build a new strategy around these 20 outlier videos and figure out how to make at least 80 to 100 videos around them. I say at least 80 to 100 is because the other 20% of our content will now be experimental. And so now we will experiment. What I do when I work with people, either in the pro group for awesomecreatoracademy.com or when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, is we build your six content pillars based on 
ability, your ability plus your market fit. Your abilities are your skills and your passions and where they intersect. So you have to like something and be good at it. And then it has to align to a total adjustable market of people that is the demand, proven demand, proven demand, and a strategy for profitability. And so when we take ability plus market fit, that is the niche that we're going to serve. Okay. So we figure out the best thing that we can do for that. Then we have that. We study our audience avatar and we build them out and we know exactly who they are. We know what they like. We know what they don't like. And that helps us with our strategies. We know what their demand is. We build out our content pillars. Then we build out formulas for our ideas that can be individual videos or series or playlist or trilogies. And we figure out those and we come up with ideas like how I came up with the Street Fighter ideas. We get a whole hundred videos out of that channel. Then we also sit there and we go, okay, and here are the ways we can monetize this and make it profitable. And here are the monetization schemas at different levels. If we have this many audience, this many viewers, we can do this, we can do that. We can't do this, can't do that. Here are our sponsors. Oh, what's our dream 100 list of potential sponsors? Oh, let's call that down to the 10 that actually are really good. Let's reach out to them. Okay, they meet our values. Hey, if not, here's their next competitor. So our dream 100 list becomes our 20 best. So again, 80, 20 rule. Here's a hundred of potential, 20 of certainty of like we want them. And then we do that. We reach out. Then out of that, we probably get five. We make long-term relationships with them for six to 12 months. That's where we make our money. That's how we become a full-time creator. So that's our business model for the brand deal side. Oh, things we didn't get brand deals for. Well, let's at least be affiliates for those. Let's pick five of them. Let's do five of the ones where our brand deals for five of the ones that we didn't get. All right. Now we have 10 affiliate links. Fantastic. We got that. Okay. Um, here's how we grow. We build the audience. We get our 1000 true fans. We move them over to memberships. We do that a handful of fans at a time. Start with 10, 10 scales to hundred, hundred scales to 200. They recruit, we get 500, we get a thousand. Great. We've got members. We got true fans. We got support. We got stable income from that stable income from brand deals start a trickle in of cash flow from affiliate links. We make a product, we sell, get transactions, we do all the things. So again, this is why I don't care about the algorithm. I don't care about the YouTube algorithm. Do I look at studying it, understanding what it responds to? Yes. Do I hunt and chase it? No, I don't care about the YouTube algorithm. I care about attracting an audience. We attract an audience by building a reputation. Then when we attract people, we deliver value for them so that they love us. And then as a result of all of that, they're going to support us in our financial goals and endeavors. So we build off of trust from a reputation. We build traffic off of content. We do revenue off transactions. That's the flywheel. That's the creator flywheel for um, profit, creator profit flywheel or profitable creator flywheel, whatever you want to say. Mm. Losing my voice here. So it's, I mean, it's very simple. Traffic is from content. Trust is from value. Um, transaction is from, um, product fulfillment of the value. So there you go. <clears throat> you make content and you package it for value to attract the viewer. Once you've attracted the viewer, you build trust by delivering value to them, giving a quality experience, putting the effort in, and then they help you achieve uh, revenue through transaction. Traffic, trust, transaction, reach, reputation, and revenue. Content creates traffic, that's reach. Value delivered creates trust that builds reputation. Ultimately, supplying a, a want or a need as a result of that is what delivers you the revenue through the transaction, either from the viewers or from the sponsors or the affiliates or the advertisers. Say Levy. Sabe? You got that? We understand? All right. Excellent. Uh, D from Healing Room ASMR. We got uh, Canadian Super Chat here. So Healing Room ASMR says, what do you do when your channel seemingly has hit a ceiling? Example, views maintained between 60 to 100K despite high effort, high quality, and consistency. Okay. So right now, you're leading in the niche, it might be time to figure out how to innovate and become a destination channel for something that is only what you, you something only you can deliver on. So in your case, it's the ASMR niche. You've done the staples, you've done 
great. You're getting 60 to 100K views. There's a strong market there. So the thing is, now you need something that might be able to expand the market itself and something that only you can deliver that is hard to duplicate and something that innovates further. So for you, the answer is probably going to be innovation. It's probably going to be innovation. The other thing is, if you feel like you're getting that per uh, view, the thing is, if you're able to maintain that, what about building systems that also says, and I can deliver more quantity of the same quality and consistency that people love and do that. So the thing is, I would say innovation and scale. I would say do innovation, bring something new to the table, and I would scale what you already have even further. I would also look at how to monetize other platforms with that same value, because if you feel like you hit a ceiling in YouTube, I'll, give, I'll tell you guys the truth. If you hit a ceiling in YouTube, duplicate yourself into another monetizable platform and double your money. So in your case, D, uh, Healing Room ASMR, consider the fact that your content can actually meet the monetization requirements for Facebook, which is very difficult because the watch time requirements for Facebook are higher than they are for YouTube to get ad revenue. However, your type of content can reach very easily and very quickly the monetization thresholds for Facebook on followers and on watch time much more quickly. So as a result of that, your content absolutely could go to the moon and make money on Facebook and Facebook um, ad revenue is as good or better than YouTube's. It's just that no one talks about it because no one qualifies for it. And creators also don't like sometimes sharing how they make their money, but I do. So what I would tell you is duplicate all of your content from YouTube over to Facebook, natively upload it. Don't paste the YouTube link. Upload the same videos to Facebook on a Facebook page. Grow the Facebook page to 10,000 if you haven't already. Get the watch time requirements because of the nature of your content. Binge upload your inventory so that you scale the watch time faster. Make all this potential um, watch time go up as quickly as possible. Get into the partner program, the creator program for Facebook. Then get those extraordinarily high CPMs for that off the ad revenue. Step four, profit. Step four, profit. So now if you hit a ceiling in YouTube, duplicate that in Facebook. Fantastic. Then I would also start looking at the Instagram um, you know, partner program. Instagram is letting you do long form in widescreen now. I'd start considering how you might do it over there just to see it, run some experiments, upload a bunch of videos, cost you nothing extra. Do that. Long form, not even short form. And just do that. Other thing is there are other monetizable platforms as well. Consider how you can do... Um, Consider whether or not there are other platforms. Like, consider like, what if I, be, what if you became like, also start uploading to Rumble, for example. There's alt tech platforms like Rumble. What if you start duplicating and uploading your library to Rumble? It's not really a crossover audience with YouTube. A lot of people have left that like care about certain things have left YouTube. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't care about ASMR if you just happen to be there. So now you might be able to increase your revenue over there on Rumble. It may not be as much as YouTube, but it's free money because you already did, you already have hundreds of videos. Just upload them to another platform and monetize it. So find the other monetizable platforms and you can increase your money, potentially double it by doing for no additional work, really. Um, do that. You can even pay an intern to just do all the uploads, frankly, because it's not really that complicated to do that. So um, just do that. And then for growing in YouTube, if you want to still grow in YouTube versus just making more money, I would say innovate and break the niche and be a destination channel where they can only get this type of thing from you because only you can make it because of the complexity involved and the creativity involved, and it can't be duplicated very easily. And then beyond that, I would scale what you already have and maintain the quality and just produce more volume of a thing that has demand. So if something is in demand, increase supply without loss of quality. Increase supply without loss of quality, that will continue to just produce more gains. So that would be my answer. Second Chair Music 499 Super Chat, thank you. Second Chair Music says, hi Roberto, I don't know if you addressed this already, but what are some viable income streams for those who upload podcasts on YouTube in the history niche? So great question. Sponsorships are obvious in the podcasting side. You wanna secure long-term six to 12 month sponsorships if you can for the podcasting side there. In the history niche specifically, you might wanna find unique Amazon products um, you might want to find unique Amazon products for history buffs that they'll like and link to 
your favorites in a shopping list for that um, in the show notes of your podcast on YouTube and in the audio version of your podcast for distribution. I'd also promote those things in the community tab on YouTube. So then you make money from the Amazon affiliate program um, there. I would obviously always promote books just for volume sake with Amazon affiliate. Cause if they put other things in your cart, they make, you make money off the other things they put in their cart while they're buying the books. So I'd always do that. Obviously I'd create potentially some kind of, um, membership as a history channel only for um the history buffs um so i would make some kind of club basically and what you do in that club is possibly um you know it might be like a book club and a community so i'd build some kind of community i'd also maybe um if you're making money from that pay someone to make really cool printable pdf um infographics and stuff like that on certain aspects of history that only the members get and that could be dope and they would really care about that um, I would consider from a merch play for you making and hiring commissioning an artist to do really great posters of certain moments in history that people would might want to put on their wall with really great quotes and do unique artwork for that unique custom artwork for that. And then do those as printable posters in high quality, sell those as your merchandise on a print on demand, uh, website that you brand. And I'd use like a dot store domain. They're not a sponsor, not yet, but they will be probably. So I do a dot store domain, do print posters, do 24 by 36 posters. If you can, those are the big ones. Those are really good ones and make it this unique artwork that you commission from a real artist, like on Fiverr or something like that. And then boom in high quality. And those would be things I'd do if I was a history podcast. <clears throat> Is content creation the new nine to five? Uh, I've seen a video about something like that. I have my own take on it. I'll do a podcast episode about it. It can be. It can definitely replace it at this point. Um, and to be highly successful, a lot of people do it with a nine to five schedule. I might be doing a little bit more than a nine to five schedule since I'm still up right now. <clears throat> Dr. B66 says, hey, Roberto, do you have a list of... Um, good content you make that you feel is underrated or have not seen. Uh, sometimes I'll talk about that in x.com, formerly Twitter. It's something I talk about with my pro group Academy members. So I don't really have a floating list out there, but um, if I do, I might write an article about it or do it for my newsletter. I probably put something about that in my newsletter, honestly. Um, so if you're on the newsletter, you'll probably see it. If you're following me on x.com, formerly Twitter, you'll probably see it. So, yeah. The nerd dial in says this guy just has all the numbers in his head. LL. Yeah, I do. But also sometimes I cheat and I have them on the other side of the screen. But I also, I also do have most of the numbers in my head. My brain works like a filing cabinet. I don't have an adidic uh, memory, which is a photographic memory. I wish I had an adidic memory, but I'm actually very close to that. I'm about like, you know, I'm about close as close as you can get to having a photographic memory without actually having a photographic memory. I wish I had a photographic memory. If I could activate a gene that lets you just have that, or if I could have uh, that gene passed on to kids so they could like just cheat at everything, photographic memory all the way if I could like do that. So, yeah. Love the stream. Thanks, Roberto. Thank you, American English with Brent. No problem, Alana Waters Piper. I've answered your question. Fantastic. So in reality, the future of feud, food with real Chef Kelly asks a question. Wow, that's a long name. Ask a question. If you were new to YouTube, yeah, I need to make a, what would I do if I was starting YouTube in 2024? I need to make that video. Um, if you are new to YouTube, are there legit services to promote or boost your visibility and stay within community guidelines? Should I buy YouTube ad space? No, never buy ad space. Never use promotional services. Don't even use the promote button in YouTube. That was made for brands to use for e-commerce stuff. The promote button in YouTube, the promote feature in YouTube is not for creators. It's for brands just like Instagram. The promote feature in Instagram is mostly for people selling stuff. It's for brands. It's not meant for creators, to be honest with you. 
So I would not use that. And no, there is no legit service. There is no legit service to boost your visibility in YouTube. They're all scams. They're all scams. There's no legit service to boost your thing. And I do not recommend using the booster or, or promo feature in YouTube because it's for brands. It's not for creators. Everyone has to do this the hard way. That's how it is. The only times you don't do it the hard way is when you're the beneficiary of nepotism, when you have a network of big creator friends or used to work for a content creator or used to work for BuzzFeed, Vice, Fox, whatever. Um, success is largely a component of uh, natural talent, ability, those kind of gifts. So the stuff that you're born with. Success is the stuff that you're born with. It's the relationships you build. So then it's nepotism. And beyond that, also um, hard work. So it's what some of you might call genuine privilege in terms of it's what you're born with, you're born with. It's nepotism and it's hard work. So it's your uh, innate abilities or characteristics. It's your innate abilities or characteristics, the hard work you do beyond that, and then the relationships you build, maintain, or we're blessed with. And nepotism doesn't have to be all bad because nepotism just means you benefit from a relationship. Relationships are hard to maintain and hard to get. And not everyone you have a relationship with will do you a solid, do you a favor. So you have to actually kind of earn a right there. So I don't actually have a problem with nepotism. I don't have a problem with nepotism. I do think that if you have a family member that'll do something for you, so there's a reason for it because every single one of us has family members that we will not go out of our way and put our neck out for. There's plenty of us that will not put our neck out for family members. So they're not benefiting from nepotism. So to benefit from nepotism, you still have to have some value to someone and maintain a relationship with them in a positive light for them to put their neck out for you. Um, hard work does matter. It can benefit from natural gifts and abilities and things you were born with or characteristics you were born with. Maybe you were born tall, so great. If you work at athletics, you have an advantage. Maybe you have pretty privilege. So if you work on your communication skills, you have an advantage. By themselves, they can do okay, but they're better when they work together. So when your natural gifts align with something you work at or vice versa, then it makes sense. If you're someone who's attractive, you should become a great communicator because of being attractive with a bad personality and bad communication skills can only get you so far, but for so long. But if you have a wonderful personality and you can communicate that wonderful personality, then you will ultimately win. And then on top of that, getting and maintaining relationships will also be easier. So if you feel like, oh, wow, pretty people have it easier and everything like that, usually they also have to be good at building and maintaining relationships and have a personality and something else they bring to the table. Otherwise, yes, they get a lot out of it and good for them because it won't last. So they had to get theirs early. So they peaked very early, if that's the case, if that's all they have. Now, people with physical athletic ability and strength, it's the same thing won't last forever. And even if they make money doing it, that money will be taken from them by people smarter than them without their ability. If they don't become smart or build relationships through networking nepotism that allow them to have people who are smart, who can protect and look out for them. And they have to be good to those people. And those people, they have to be at least good at judging character so that those people don't screw them over. So if you look at it, someone attractive or athletic still loses if they don't also at some degree work hard at relationships and becoming smart to some degree. This was just my long-winded way of saying you cannot really rig YouTube. You will have to do things the hard way and people who you think of, like aside from people who, rare exception of people who could rig the game, what they really did was they figured out the right combination of aligning their talent and abilities to things they could scale by working hard at and then building relationships that would matter and maintaining them. That's how all success really works. The abilities you're born with, the work that you do, the relationships that you build and keep. Yeah, Ty's Hot Mess History in the house. Another successful client from Awesome Creator Academy, Silver Play Button Champion. Yes, uh, speaking of 1%, you want to try to come 1% better with every single video. Absolutely, I agree with that. That's where my philosophy of make 100 crappy videos and get better at them every time, get 1% better every time was key. Magnify Reacts, another successful Awesome Creator Academy student on the way to a silver play button. Congratulations. When you do get that silver play button, um, I've got to send you the info. We've got to, um, I'm going to pay for a copy of that silver play button when you get it because you're pretty close now. You'll get it this year. You'll get it this year. 
and um, we got to put it on the wall. We got to put it in the Academy Hall of Fame. So we have um, Jen from Sewing Report. Jen from Sewing Report. Um, we got a copy of her play button. It's going up on the wall here. We got the YouTube uh, letter as well. But yeah, this silver play button from Jen from Sewing Report, this one is going up on the wall for the Hall of Fame. So the Awesome Creator Academy Hall of Fame. We're building that out. I have the wall space. I haven't decided if I'm going to paint the wall or not, though. I haven't decided if I'm going to paint the wall. What I should have done is instead of putting up my um, Monopoly guys, but they're staying up. Instead of putting up my Monopoly guys, what I should have done is that should have been the wall for the Hall of Fame, and I should have put the play buttons there. But that would have also only held maybe nine of them at best, six to six or nine of them. So it's probably better that I'm going to use the wall in front of me, even though you won't see it in the videos unless I uh, do a screenshot or pan to it or something like that, the wall for the Hall of Fame. Um, but which is unfortunate uh, because it, it, it make better design sense. But that wall is too small. Well, so I need it to be the bigger wall. But uh, yeah, we'll add yours, uh, Magnify, to the Hall of Fame. Smart money, bro. Roberto, appreciate you. I'll be rewinding this to see the whole live. No questions, just a shout of appreciation. Thank you so much. If you could start YouTube all over again, what's the one thing you'd do differently? If I could start YouTube all over again, the thing that I would do differently is I would have went sooner to doing um, two to three videos a week. I would have went sooner to two to three videos a week, and I would have actually only um, done videos based on how well the videos of a similar topic had previously performed, and then only 20% experimental, like I said, 80% proven success, 20% experimental, and I would have studied what was working in my niche more, and would have done that. So I got to 100,000 before I started doing YouTube help videos. I got to 100,000 helping freelancers, actually, because I became a full-time freelancer, and that's how I became a full-time content creator. Full-time freelancer lets you leave your 9-to-5 job, control all of your time, make money that you can invest. You, as a freelancer, if you were doing what I was doing, you might get some help with people to where you have someone who will hold a camera for you, help you out or something like that, or a relative will do it. In my case, my brother or my best friend would do it. Um, hold a camera for me sometimes and you gain experience and expertise being a freelancer in a variety of things that can be used for content creation so i became a freelancer right and so then my content creation revolved around my freelancing and my freelancing skills and also marketing yourself and getting clients which translates all the way to being a youtuber because it's the same thing the skills i use to get freelancing clients are the skills i use to get brand deal clients the skills i use that I was selling to other people are the skills of a content creator. So I did freelancing, right? So if I did YouTube all over again, and I was going to go into that niche of helping freelancers, what I would have done is I would have studied the market, or in my case, if I had to build the market because other people weren't doing it successfully, um, I still would have done 80-20 rule. So I would have done the 80-20 rule. I will make a video. I will make several videos about what I would do if I was starting YouTube all over again, or if I was starting YouTube today. And I'll tell you a shorthand version of it is, I'd apply the 80-20 rule to content strategy. So I'd apply the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 proven success, 20% experiments, and I would do that, okay? The other thing I would do is I'd make sure that I really understood my audience avatar and that I aligned my ability to market fit to find the right niche. Mine was, I did that perfectly already, but I just didn't understand it formally at the time. I'd upload two to three videos per week that can be some of the best content in my niche and package it perfectly. I learned this the hard way because I grew when I started doing daily content and that was what allowed me for what I was doing to go. I grew and I didn't make a video at this at the time. I should have made a video about this when it happened. So guys, what if I told you that I grew by 100,000 subscribers in about a year. I gained 100,000 subscribers in about a year. And then I did it over and over again for another two or three years. I started that by doing daily content. Then I went down to about 150 videos that were the right videos using the 80-20 rule. That's how I grew and how I got to 400,000 subscribers. And then the pandemic hit. And then um, I didn't grow as much um, because of the pandemic because then I got depression during the pandemic. 
And then I stopped uploading 150 videos and went to uploading 40 or 50 videos. Then I only grew, only grew by 30 to 40,000 a year during the pandemic. So during the pandemic years, I slacked off and it was because I got in my feelings and I got depressed and I started doom scrolling and all the things. I also gained, at the time I gained about, um, I want to say about roughly 18 pounds. So I went to about uh, 160 at that point, which was the largest I like ever been. I wouldn't get fat, fat or nothing, but like for me, I've been a fit guy my whole life. So gaining 18 pounds was a nightmare during the pandemic. I've since shed a bunch of that weight. So I was at about, I ended up going to about like, I want to say 162, 164. And then now I'm down to, I've lost a bunch of that and I'm now down to like 155 and I hover between 152 and 155 and I'm going to break it down to where I go back under 150, but I'm gaining muscle mass at the same time. Cause what I did was I increased my protein, increased my muscle mass. So I shed all the, all, a lot, most of the fat, not all of it yet. I shed most of the fat gained muscle. But the thing is, I didn't like myself on camera. I didn't like what I was seeing. That's the honest truth of it. So I got COVID depression and I stopped uploading um, because of that. And it really hurt the growth and momentum of the channel. Otherwise I'd be at a million subscribers right now. If I kept uploading at the pace I was before the pandemic, you can check my stats before the pandemic. I was doing a hundred thousand new subscribers a year, a year consistently before the pandemic. So think about it. We had these pandemic years. I would have gotten another 400,000 subscribers if it wasn't for the COVID depression during the pandemic. And if I hadn't gotten my feelings and felt depressed about seeing myself on camera with the weight gain, that's what, that's the truth. That's what happened. So if I had to do it all over again, 80, 20 rule, upload two to three times a week based on the 80, 20 rule, make sure that I understand my audience and my market fit plus my abilities equals my niche. So I have a profitable niche with market demand that fits my skills and my passions, which I did that at least correctly. So I do that all over again. I would be growing consistently off of that. And the other thing that I would do differently all over again is I would never sign with a multi-channel network. Uh, an MCN is a multi-channel network. I would never sign with that again. I did that at 14,000 subs. It was a mistake and they were taking 50% of my AdSense, never, ever, ever do that deal. I was locked into that deal for years. Never, ever do that. Never sign with a multi-channel network. And if a company says, oh, we can get you brand deals, they should only take 20% of your brand deals and none of your AdSense. Do not ever give up any of your AdSense to a company ever, 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 ever in your life, ever. So I would never do that again. And then what's the fifth thing I can tell you? What's the fifth thing? What's the fifth thing I could tell you? Obviously, I would put in the highest effort possible into my thumbnails, but that's kind of a throwaway. That's kind of a doy. So I would do that. It's another thing I would do differently because I did a lot right, to be honest with you. I did a lot right. I would grow the email list sooner. I would grow the email list sooner. I would start the new email newsletter. I'd grow the email list sooner. So yeah, there you go. Five things. Five things. What equipment do you recommend to start? If you don't want to start with your phone, get a Sony ZV, um, ZV-1F. ZV get a Sony ZV-1F if you don't want to start with your phone. So uh, get uh, one of these. Sony ZV-1F. Get one of these. Um, or you can get a Sony, Sony ZV-E10 if you want to use a lens. This one has a uh, lens already built in, but it only goes wide to 10 millimeters and tight to 20 millimeters. So it's very vlogging or live stream style, uh, but it's like 400, 500 bucks and it's everything all in one. You get a microphone for this. So you probably get a deity microphone. Uh, still, I still have some of these from the giveaway. I'm still giving away some of these. Um, so uh, you get something like the deity D4 duo. I think this is like $59 or something like that. So get uh, that for a microphone for a light. If you're on a desk, you get an Elgato key light uh, for 159. If you need a ring light and that's cheap for you, get it from newer, N-E-E-W-E-R, newer, $89 ring light. I use that for a while. It's all you need if you're going to do close-ups, but it doesn't work if you have glasses. So be aware of that. If you need something else, you get the Aperture 60D is a $159 light and it's a cob light. It's basically all you would need. I'd put a diffuser on it, but again, like that's all you need. 
and that would be powerful enough. I use that in the basement setup downstairs. It's more than powerful enough if you use it um, at an angle or straight on high above you. And so that gives you a light for audio. If you're at a desk, get like something like a Shure MV7 um, with the USB. Um, or if you need something for like a hundred bucks, get an Elgato Wave 3. Um, I'll uh, eventually, I'll do a stream that's all about gear. I'll do a stream for you guys eventually that's all about gear. I might do that stream from the basement setup um, because I have, it'll be easier to show off the gear for the way that setup is versus how this setup is. So I'll do a stream all about gear. So look forward to that. I will do videos on the channel about gear and budget gear going forward. I'll do something like, oh, best lights for under $200, best microphones for under uh, $300, best cameras for under $1,000. I'll, I'll do stuff like that. That's coming. That is planned. What is the best website you recommend for thumbnails and not really good with graphics? Um, I have a couple of templates you can buy. I usually will go with the um, YouTube starter kit, but that's a bigger product. But if you need something that's a little cheaper, something that's a little cheaper, um, we have the creator starter pack. Yeah, it's you have to go to. I don't think we have a landing page for it yet, but if you go to Awesome Creator Academy's store, we if you scroll down to the very bottom, we have a nine dollar creator starter pack, and get that here. Starter pack. Oh yeah, we do have a landing page for it. Hang on. Starter. Yeah, we do have a starter pack. I just need to find the link for it. Excuse me one second. I'm trying to find it. www.awesomecreatoracademy.com slash, I think it's starter pack. Yeah, here it is. So we have a creator starter pack. I think we've got 20 templates in here. Um, this one's a $9 product. We're going to update it with some more stuff. The YouTube starter kit has much, much more stuff in it, and it's a lot better. But this is actually pretty good to start out with. Now, this gives you templates, and you can edit these. Even if you don't have Photoshop, if you go to Adobe Express, Adobe Express is free, and you can use Adobe Express to open and modify Photoshop files if you don't have a copy of Photoshop. So that's a free tool you can use. You can also use photop.com, P spelled like peas in a pod, photop, spelled P-E-A, dot com, photop, and that would allow you to edit Photoshop templates if you buy them from me or anything else or anyone else. Now, if you need to hire somebody to do thumbnails for you, you can use Fiverr, and you can also use ytjobs.co. YT is in YouTube, jobs.co. Patty Galloway runs that website. Those would be the places to get thumbnail designers to do it for you. But if you're not good at graphics, as long as you take a good photo of yourself or you use um, a stock image and then you use a template, it'll be fine. Will it be unique compared to everyone else, even if you modify it? Not so much, but the thing is, a lot of you are overrating unique versus effective and original versus effective. Sometimes you just need what is effective and it's enough to get you started. So you can start with something that's better than what you can do on your own. 80-20 rule, 80% of the work is done for you. You do the other 20% of customization, your words, your image, your you know color scheme, done, boom. So um, that would help you. Um, also in that starter pack, we also give you a two-page media kit for reaching out to brands. So... Um, that's another one of our $9 products that can help you. So that's uh, at least something with Awesome Creator Academy that we do is we at least have some entry-level products for people. So here's a question. Uh, Purple Blue says, do you need a college degree, certification, or even high school diploma for YouTube, or can you just join film classes, workshops to learn about YouTube, become an entrepreneur, self-taught? Um, yeah, there's no degree in this. And the thing is, it wouldn't make sense for there to be a degree in this because no college professor is going to have a silver play button. So what's the point? Most college professors, there's no way that they have a YouTube channel that they've gotten monetized in most cases. It'd be very rare for a college professor to have a monetized YouTube channel. So why are you going to learn that from them? Most college professors 
have never made a video. They got a hundred thousand views on YouTube. So what's the point of learning from them? And then they've never gotten a silver play button on YouTube. So how are they going to give you a degree in content creation or the creator economy? None of them made a hundred thousand dollars doing content creation. If they did, they really wouldn't be teaching in college anymore. They would just be a full-time creator if they've done that. And then they'd make multiple six figures. What, what are they going to do? How are they going to make six figures in college? You know, that's very rare. So, uh, no, there's not going to be a degree in it. There's going to come a needed degree. I would say get a high school diploma for sure. Never drop out of high school. That's stupid. Never drop out of high school. Um, you know, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. Oh, if I, I go full time, I would drop out of school. No, finish high school. Finish high school. There's like three or four successful YouTubers that dropped out of high school and were successful. And you know what? Most of them were privileged freaking brats anyway. I've only known a couple of people that have dropped out of high school and never become successful in life. You, you should at least finish high school. You at least need to have the mental discipline and fortitude and emotional control to get through and stomach high school. There's very few people who can do it. Most people who drop out of school are privileged if they succeed still. If they still succeed, their mommy and daddy's got them. Six failure for them is I go back to mommy and daddy in the suburbs in a very nice half a million dollar house. That's what like, or more than that if it's California. That's who drops out of school to do YouTube. That's who drops out of high school to do YouTube. No, finish high school. Finish at freaking high school. No one has my permission to drop out of high school to do YouTube. I will literally come for you. Like, I will literally come for you. Your parents will call me up and everything like that for me to, you know, be like, to read you the riot act and make you cry. I will yell at you. I will yell. Your parents will fly me down and I will yell and scream in your face and make you cry and make you delete your channel if you quit high school to do YouTube. Yeah, there you go. I said it. So, yeah, not playing with y'all out here. <laughs> uh, Jamie Ratchel, $1 super chat. Thank you. Appreciate you. Probably going to wrap up here in a minute. It's getting late. I need to eat something. Tawana Yvette on demand, $5 super chat. By the way, whoever does the timestamps for this, as long as someone does a good job of the timestamps in the comments, I will pick the person who did the best timestamps. I will use their timestamps and I will use the YouTube tag feature to kind of shout them out in the description for the timestamps for everyone who um, you know does that. And um, if I pin the timestamps in the comment section, I'll still mark their channel and kind of shout them out of timestamps provided by at and then their channel name. So whoever does the timestamps for this video, I will at your channel name in the description and kind of shout you out that way. And thank you for that. So, um, yeah. So Tawana Yvette on demand says, I would love to start reacting to music, but how can I do it without getting copyright strikes? Thank you. The easiest and best way would be to buy a license from, um, artlist or licked.com, which is licked without an E or, if you're doing it and it's a song from Universal Music Group, Universal Music Group now has a service where creators can license a song from Universal Music Group. By the way, Universal Music Group pulled their library from TikTok today, and creators are telling me that their uh, content is being muted if they use songs from Universal Music Group on TikTok. So the free-for-all on copyright with TikTok, that those days are over. See, I told you TikTok is on its way out. So yeah, so that's how you'd avoid the copyright strikes. That's the easiest way to do it. Also, you want to interrupt the music every like 10 seconds probably or 15 seconds with your commentary. So that would probably help a lot as well. And obviously try to avoid using like the full song and in order and all that jazz. If you want a good example of this, uh, Magnify Reacts is um, a member of Awesome Creator Academy who's done a music reaction channel. So uh, Flight From Reality, $10 Super Chat. Flight From Reality Ask, hey, Roberto, have you seen patterns for video essay channels to create hit videos, controversy, or make it to the front page? Video essayists will have massive pop-off videos that launch their brand. Yes, it's. Um, I think I termed this the five Cs. So I think it's uh, controversy, conflict, conspiracy, contrarian views, and curiosity. So it's the five C's, right? So these five C's will work in almost any niche, but they especially work for video essay style channels. So obviously controversy in terms of a controversial event, controversial figure. So that's one. Two, 
take um, a polarizing subject matter and take the opposing contrarian view to the mainstream view on a subject matter. So contrarian view, take the most polarizing stance possible. Okay, so controversy, polarizing figure or event, contrarianism, polarizing stance on a mainstream uh, popular thing that is emotionally charged that a lot of people are invested in. So remember, total addressable market. Controversial, famous figure. Controversial, famous figure. That's number one. Okay. Take notes, everybody. See, this is why I also got to, I got to publish a workbook and then y'all can buy the workbook to take notes on these things and to build out your strategies on paper. But um, this is like a version of Roberto's five rules of clickbait. Okay. So Roberto's five rules of clickbait. One, controversial public figure that is a household name. Controversial public figure that is a household name. Number two, contrarian view, polarizing stance on a broad mainstream subject, polarizing stance on that. Granted, both of these things make you vulnerable to community guidelines and demonetization, so you might be playing with fire. Be aware of that. There are ways to do it. Controversial figure. CoffeeZilla covers scams and scam artists, and so he covers controversial figures who are household names that commit scams, like Logan Paul, for example. Okay. Polarizing uh, subject matter. Crypto is a polarizing subject matter. Um, so take a contrarian or polarizing view on that. There's a way to do that. That's just crypto is just one example. Obviously, politics is another, but another one could be movies, music. So a primary example would be, um, hey, here's a popular thing like Star Wars. Take a polarizing view on that. Here's a popular thing. Marvel, take a polarizing view on that. Um, so on and so forth. So polarizing point of view, contrarian. So contrarianism, polarizing point of view. That's the second C. Okay. Third one, curiosity. Curiosity is too good to ignore, too weird to ignore, um, too big to ignore. So it's like, what happens if I drop a van onto a trampoline? Now, again, you might not be able to afford to do that. Also, you might need permits. Also, avoid people getting hurt, clearly. You know, but, oh, what happens if I pour a bag of Orbeez down a bathtub. Uh, yeah, you might not be able to afford that, and that might go very bad, and that might violate some laws, so be careful. Okay, but uh, those are just examples of, oh, that's too weird to ignore. I can't ignore that. Oh, what does 100 of this look like? What does 1,000 of this look like? What does 10,000 of this look like? So, again, too big to ignore. Um, so, that was, um, so we had controversial controversy, controversial figure. We did contrarian view. We did curiosity. So conspiracy, uh, exposing a conspiracy could be conspiracy. Unraveling a conspiracy can be, um, that talking about an existing conspiracy, listing out conspiracies around a certain thing or suggesting conspiracy. And this could be not a real conspiracy. It could be a conspiracy within a show game of Thrones. There was a lot of thing about, Oh, what's the, um, Dorn conspiracy or what's like this or what's that? Uh, what's the plot? What's this? You know, so even within a show, there are people who have conspiracy theories about uh, Real Housewives or reality TV or something like that, or Love and Hip Hop or 90 Day Fiance. So there can be conspiracies within shows, for example, conspiracies within communities. It's not all about politics. It's like conspiracies can exist in other ways. Okay. Could literally be in the fictional universe of a show like, oh, the Dumbledore conspiracy. Like, okay. So you have um, conspiracy. And then what I say the last one was? It was controversy, conspiracy, contrarian views, curiosity. What did I say the fifth one was? Why is why is my brain uh, fogging right now? Somebody tell me what I said the fifth one was. It was it was it was contrarian views. It was conspiracy. It was controversial figure. It was curiosity. What did I say the fifth one was? Why am I spacing on this? Why can't I remember? Actually, I have it written down somewhere. I'll just find it. I have it written down. Conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Conflict. Okay. So you can cover something where a conflict of some kind occurred. And I'm not talking about war, mind you. But you can... You can do something where 
there is inherent conflict. So sometimes this is actually something that a lot of people do in um, like shows, for example, you can create conflict. Conflict can also be contrast. Conflict could be versus videos, this thing versus that. Conflict could be storytelling. So it could be, hey, here's this thing that you know causes us to feel a certain kind of way. So it can be um, conflict. And conflict could include comparison, by the way. Conflict could be um, comparison. So as long as it creates conflict or tension or it had conflict in it built in. Primary example, some people, they make videos about conflict between celebrities, beefs between celebrities, beef between rappers, beef between communities can be a source of conflict. Another one could be beef between brands or brand X versus brand Y. So conflict can be also a matter of compare and contrast. So conflict, those things versus videos, we like conflict and we like contrast. So those are basically my five C's of clickbait. So find things that have conflict, things that are also um, have conflict in the community. So that will incite conflict in the comments of people arguing in the comments over their favorite preferred side. Uh, you want an example of this in the real world? Death battle, death battle. Oh, um, you know, um, what is it? Like Galactus versus Unicron. That was the conflict. That is a versus thing. So death battle does this all the time. Celebrity deathmatch did this back in the MTV days. In fact, death battle is just um, a modern day version of celebrity deathmatch, but with other fictional characters instead of just um, pop culture characters. So um, there you go. Um, yes, for the Street Fighter thing, uh, Street Fighter 2, beating Street Fighter 2 only using light punch, using Street Fighter 2 only using one attack, Us beating Street Fighter 2 only using the Hadouken, um, using, beating Street Fighter, or sorry, not Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 6 using only Hadouken. Like, yeah, it'd be something like that. Um, through a glass darkly says, yep, 100% about a view is a view. 100%, yep. Add it again. Media says, Mr. Blake, thanks for sharing transparently about the gist of YouTube and how to make it if you're serious about building a brand. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to do a couple more super chats. Then we're going to start to wrap this up. We're about three hours in. So again, to old man Roberto's bedtime. $10 super chat from Orlando Miner says, appreciate the game, bro. Keep doing you. Thank you so much. Any tips on helping people join a newsletter? I created one a few weeks ago with a free PDF in my DIY niche cricket so far. Well, like I said, a uh, community tab, promoting in the community tab, um, making a freebie for it. Like I said, like my version of doing a freebie was we did the 12 week YouTube creator playbook, become a better content creator in 12 weeks. And so we made a multi slide PDF. We gave people fo a focus, a resource and an assignment. And then we go into details of that and so we have a 12 page pdf for uh 12 weeks to become a better content creator so that was my freebie get it in linkedin description so far by the way we still have um uh about 150 of you watching live right now three hours in we still have 150 of you watching live every single one of you needs to hit the like button for the youtube algorithm if you're watching the replay hit the like button for the youtube algorithm if you had an array you should have by now and if you have not downloaded the 12 week guide absolutely do it what I just showed you is also how you promote your newsletter. So you do that. You put an in info card of your videos. You go back to your other videos. You put it in the pinned comment of your other videos. You put it in the community tab. If you do something else in the community tab, you make that the pinned comment of that post in the community tab. That's how you promote your newsletter. We will do an entire workshop on the channel at some point about growing and promoting your newsletter. KW Shops says, I'm struggling with new topics. I can't anticipate what my audience wants to see. I ask them repeatedly. Um, and the ideas that I get are consistently at least, populated, uh, least popular videos I make. Eight years, 40K subs. Okay, like I said, find someone that's the next level bigger than you. If you're at um, 40K subs, look at creators that are 50 and 100K subs. Look at their most popular videos find the most popular videos that have been made within the last 12 months from them, find multiple creators like this. So your mission is to find 
five or 10 creators that are 50K subs, same level basically as you, find uh, find 10 creators that are at 100K subs, get um, a bunch of videos from them a piece, their 10 most popular piece. This is gonna give you a list of like 100 videos. Call that down to the ones that are the most popular in the last year. That will then give you topics to choose from. And you won't have to struggle anymore because now you have proof of the market demand. There will be no anticipating. There will be no guessing. You will have proof. So in the end, and the absence of anticipating or asking, just find proof of market demand. Then you know what to do. Now remix those ideas and make them your own. That's the answer. That is the answer. In the room, ASMR says, mind blown. Thanks, Roberto. You're welcome. You are welcome. Ketone says, Roberto, you're already dropping more value. I'm still trying to absorb all the value from your last live stream. Much respect. Yep. Yep. Still catching up on the super chat. Still catching on this. I'm about uh, 20 minutes behind on the chat here. Life with not to uh, $10 super chat. Thank you. Not to says, hi, Roberto. Does posting from IG Reels to Facebook affect monetization? Like when you post on my IG reels and automatically post on Facebook. To my knowledge, if you're not in both uh, partner programs, then no, it wouldn't affect it to my knowledge. Yeah, you can end up working more hours as a content creator, but the flexibility is much better. That's been my experience anyway. Shark Scrap says, hey, Roberto, agree. Nothing wrong with nepotism as long as one is worthy of the favor being granted. Why not help somebody you know be successful as long as they're capable? Absolutely. That's why I don't have a problem with it when it's the right way. Yep. Yep, so report, Jen. Honored to be on the Wall of Fame. Yep. Grape T News says 4K away from 100K. Fantastic. Congratulations. And yeah, if you're a, a larger creator, you probably can still get value from these streams, believe it or not. It's been proven. I've worked with creators with over a million subscribers. I've helped some creators get over a million subscribers. There's always something to learn in an area of expertise. Not everyone has to have a gold play button or be a millionaire. Sometimes they have an expertise that's still valuable for you. You'll need more room for that uh, for your play buttons. Yeah, I'll need more room than the uh, than that sidewall over there. Absolutely. Like T, I got to get up with you about giving you um, you know another thirty minute uh, consultation and workout, uh, getting a copy for the Hall of Fame. I will pay for the extra play button and I will pay for the shipping. But we got to get that up in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Little Mouse Production, $10 Canadian Super Chat. Hey, Roberto, how much effort did it take for you to reach from 10K to 100K for your first silver play button? Thanks. I'm trying to figure out. Rough idea. So for me, it was 800 videos. Um, it was 800 videos, but I could have done it with less because if I had just refined the strategy the way I suggested when I talked about what I would do differently, that's why. It would have taken me considerably less. That's why I stopped doing 365 videos a year and went down to 150. So I could do it with a third of that. So like I said, like if it was 800 videos, I could have probably done it with about 300 of the right videos. So I could have done that. I got to 10K in 11 months of doing it seriously, but I was only doing one video a week. I should have done two to three. I would have got there sooner. Two years to get to 20K doing the same thing. Went to daily, grinded it out doing daily, went and was able to jump in 2015 from 20k to 75k by the end of 2015 by the spring of 2016 100k uh so by you know so about 15 months to go from 20k to 120k in about 15 15 months or so 15 16 months so a year and change year and change to gain a whole another 100k uh if i'd been strategic i could have done it all faster so what i would have done is i would have done three videos a week, and I probably could have done it a lot sooner for what my niche was, but I also needed the experience. So for me, the tuition was the experience. I need that many videos because I need to get that much experience in a short period of time. So for me, 
it's quite literally to me as an anime reference. My version of it was I went into the hyperbolic time chamber for a year and I came out stronger. That's how, like, that's how I did it. I went to the hyperbolic time chamber. This is a dragon ball reference. So I went to the hyperbolic time chamber and I came out five times stronger. That's how I leveled up. That's how I got my power level. I went to the hyperbolic time chamber for a year and took my power level from 20,000 to a hundred thousand. That's how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the anime fans who watch Dragon Ball Z will get the reference. Android stud, 79K subs to go to 100K. Hey, look, having 21,000 is still a lot. Keep going. Would you recommend starting a faceless channel? I would start a faceless channel if you are somebody who um, is uncomfortable on camera, you're shy, you're not confident in your appearance. Uh, I would do it if in that case, yeah. I mean, my channel mostly ended up initially being tutorials, so I was faceless for like a lot of my videos. My early Photoshop videos were all faceless videos, and those were the things that got me the most views. Um, so uh, I've done faceless before, so... Yeah. If you are shy on camera or you're not confident in your appearance, that would be the way to go. Um, I don't fully understand uh, this question. Oh, we got a new channel member. We got uh, Rainbow Plush Co. became a channel member. I'm working on something for the channel members. We're actually going to do, we have a hundred videos that are channel members only that people can watch in the archive. We're doing some new videos on this this year, and I'm going to duplicate those videos over to the Creator Vault, um, which is going to be a new thing we do on Awesome Creator Academy later. I'll give you details for that later. But also, I'm going to keep randomly, I think we'll do it once a week. Once a week, I'm going to pick a random channel member, and I'm going to do a recorded review of their channel and post that to the members only community. So that's how I'm going to also supplement my members only content is by picking random channel members to do channel reviews of and do like a 10 minute recorded review and then give it only to the members and that member. So, yeah. Let's see, I'm still a couple of minutes behind on the chat. How much content should go into a newsletter? Um, it can be anywhere from 300 to 800 words, and that should be solid, honestly. Um, it just has to be value that your readers would want. It doesn't have to be a long read. Um, I would say anything that is a three minute to eight minute read could be good. And there are um, tools you can use to figure out how many words equals that um, three to eight eight minute reading time and they should be able to scan it and read it like very comfortably by the way benjamin salstrom asked question what's the best service to use to gather emails and get a newsletter started how frequently should a newsletter go out i was thinking quarterly to start out with i am going to tell you that i would go against quarterly i would tell you that it should be um at least twice a month I would say use ConvertKit. I've linked to it in the description and I put it in the chat a couple of times. So um, ConvertKit to start, which will let you do it for free. And I would say put it out two times a month because otherwise your email list gets cold, gets cold. So you wanna keep it warm. So I say at least two times a month. That's also why I do the evergreen thing so that uh, for 12 months, 24 emails go out, one a month that's purely information and then one that's promotional uh, so that goes out twice a month, 24 pre written emails. Then I actually do my written emails. And so I'd like to do that every week. Eventually I want to get to doing that twice a week. Uh, 
uh, what is the best way to promote or increase reach in the kids space? I'm going to give you, it sounds so simple, but I'm not joking. Bright colors and music. I am not joking. And that sounds so simple, but it's actually hard to execute. Bright colors and music is literally the answer. And believe it or not, word of mouth from the parents. Colette says, Roberto, I just want to thank you for writing your book. You're very welcome. If you guys have not got yet, create something awesome. How creators are profiting from their passion, the Creator Academy in Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and everywhere books are sold. Um, get it now. Um, so Roberto, I just want to thank you for writing your book. It's my go-to gift for my content creator friends. Well, thank you, Colette. I appreciate you. Yes, water cooler topics. If you see a lot of people talking about it, then talk about it. Uh, yep, I agree with that. KW Shop says, I need your insights. I need help with content ideas. I've tried asking my viewers, and when I do, the videos tank, or they offer the most obvious topics. That's why I, I actually gave you exactly what to do for that. So I answered that earlier. Like I said, um, if you're at 40K subs, which it sounds like you were from your post, you find... 10 people at 50K subs, maybe five or 10 people at 50K subs, five or 10 people at 100K subs. You look at the 10 most popular videos they've ever done or the 10 most uh, recent videos they've done or most popular. You call down to the most popular and the most recent. You then start to see what topics those are in common. And then you have a baseline saying, this is proof of demand. Do not ask your audience. Do not ask them. They, they will not be honest with you with their words. They're honest with you with their actions and attention. So you find where they gave attention already, and then you are able to pull from that. There's no more assumption. There's no more asking. You just analyze. So we don't ask. We don't assume. We analyze. Does everyone hear that? I want to say it again. We don't ask. We don't assume. We analyze. And I told you exactly the methodology that I use and that I teach for doing that. That's what we teach in the pro group. That's why I teach my one-on-one -on -one clients. We don't ask, we don't assume, we analyze. So what we do is we find someone that's already succeeding at what we do and we find more than one person. We're not gonna be a copycat, but we are gonna aggregate the best results and say, okay, and the people winning in my space are talking about these things and I've called it down and in the last couple of weeks, last couple of months in the last year, these are what people wanted from them and where they got views and where they gave their, their attention. Where they gave their attention is where I will go. Yep, curiosity, conflict, controversy, contrarian views, and conspiracy. So that's the five C's of clickbait, the five C's of clickbait. Um, I will do an infographic coming soon on the five C's of clickbait. I will do, you know, um, five, you know, five, like these, um, five clickbait hacks YouTubers use to get views. Five clickbait hacks YouTubers use to get viral views. That's a title for Roberto. Yay. We did it. Let's see, almost caught up here. Oh, we have a super chat from She Fires. Thank you for the $19.99 super chat. Thank you for your time and insight, Roberto. Thank you, I appreciate you. How do you become fast at editing? Okay, so we actually do talk about this in the 12 week creator playbook. We actually have a section on this. So, and we cover more than one thing about it. We do enhance your editing skills. So the focus is on the basics of cutting, transitions, and layering. And we say for resources, you can use Adobe Premiere Cut Pro and Final Cut Pro tutorials or online editing courses in Skillshare. So what you do is it's whatever software you're using, because you might be using CapCut, for example, which is free. I will do a tutorial on CapCut, um, the paid and free version. I'll do a, a tutorial on the free version, and then I'll do a tutorial on the paid version of CapCut to do basic editing. And I'll also do my green screen tutorial for that too. So um, just like I did for Adobe Premiere Pro stuff. So the basics of it is you go through and you spend like 10 hours on a weekend, 10 pure hours on a weekend doing 
tutorial videos and learning the ins and outs of the basics of the tool that you're using. And by that weekend, after 10 hours, you've probably spent more and it's not, oh, cause I need to get this video out. No, you sit there and you only study, you only practice, you only edit. By the time you did this for one weekend, if you do that for one weekend, and then you practice and learn little things along the way throughout a week. And then if you ever go back and you spend, okay, another weekend, another day off, another 10 hours doing it, by the time you spent 20 to 40 hours, you have spent more time learning, learning to edit than most people have in any given tool because people do not practice. They practice when they're putting out a video and that's the poorest way to practice. Learn the actual software, go through the tutorials, learn step-by-step, step, learn each feature that you actually need to use and why you need to use it. And that will level you up and you will be faster because you will not be guessing. If you know, you're not guessing and that makes you faster. So um, the main way to do this is to take a um, raw footage of five minutes and use these techniques on five minutes of raw footage and apply it. And that will be what will help you. And so you will level up and you'll be faster. The other thing you can do, and we talk about this, is then eventually start practicing sound design. Get a bunch of audio and sounds and learn how to properly mix it with your voiceover track so that it doesn't sound muffled and it's not overpowering it. And so you learn to master the audio mixing in your videos. Then you learn sound design with saying, I'm gonna put a transition and I'm gonna sync a sound effect and time a sound effect to a transition or to an effect in screen. And you learn how to do that, when to do that. And you learn to mix that and get that to where all the levels and everything sounds good. And you do that. And then you've learned um, sound design. Then another different week, you focus only on motion graphics and how to use motion text and motion images and you use your software or you learn After Effects and you incorporate basic animations into your videos. Uh, you learn how to edit After Effects templates or if you use a different software, you learn how to edit the, temp the templates and plugins for that. And so boom. And then if you do those things, if you learn basic video editing and you focus on cuts, color correction, audio correction in your basic editing software, then you learn sound design, for um, your music bed and then your sound effects and your mixing. And then you learn motion graphics for image and text and transitions. If you learn those things and you build off of that foundation, you literally have only now needed to learn nine techniques to really master video editing at a high level. Everything after that is fluff, it's extra dressing. No one really needs more than 12 techniques as a video editor, no one. And most of what you need to copy the biggest YouTubers is only about maybe six techniques at best. 12 techniques will put you in overkill status to where you can do everything. Um, the advanced version is moving up to about roughly 15 techniques because then that would include green screen, multicam, and probably um, I would say green screen, multicam, and speed ramping. And then um, after that, maybe masking. Those are like much higher more advanced techniques and then motion tracking. But then like, that's when you're going into like freaking like absurd levels of techniques. That's like freaking being Jonin level. That's like crazy. No one needs to do that. So like um, no one needs to be Jonin ninja level. Like, you know, that's somewhere between Jonin level and Kage level. You don't need to be an S ranked criminal out here in these streets. Again, my anime nerds will know those references. So um, it's fine to just be a, a B class to A class editor. No one needs to be an S class editor to succeed. And most of you should just study your tools well enough to be a C to B class editor. And a C to a B to C class editor is good enough to get ten thousand to a hundred thousand potential. Well, no, I would no. That's actually closer to the thumbnail thing because the editing isn't what gets you views aside from the word of mouth. But in terms of retention, for retention, you only need to be a C to B class editor for retention. Um, and so. You know, that, that's all you need to do. Editing isn't what gets you views until people are talking about you because you're editing. And people start talking to you about your editing after you're like A rank. In some niches, though, B rank. In some niches, B rank. Uh, Philip Molina. Hey, how's it going, man? I've earned millions of subs, have billions of views, and Roberto Stream still have me with my notebook out, re-drilling down on the basics deeper and deeper, constantly searching for new wisdom. Thank you. That's the truth. And like, man, could not ask for a better shout out than that. Could not, 
you know, asked for a better endorsement than that. And Philip, Philip has actually worked with some of the biggest content creators in the world. He's worked with Mr. Beast and others, and he knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows his thing. And I really appreciate the support, brother. Thank you for the 999 super chat, but more importantly, thank you for the kind words. Really appreciate you. Bible and Geek says, uh, convert kids. Great. Also what I use. Yep, absolutely. Uh, building uh, your YouTube channel. Stephen Vaughn says, building your YouTube channel. I think realistically, I won't be able to make a YouTube full-time gig until year two. Shortcut to it, Stephen, is if you can do freelancing and make more money freelancing than a nine to five job and also do it because you're not trading time for money, you're trading results for money. You go to freelancing, you do flat rates, and then you're able to make the money you need to live off of without always having to give up 40 hours a week to do it and having a flexible schedule. Now you have time freedom. Now you have time freedom. And if you can make more than you need to live off of with time freedom and investment capital, you can grow your YouTube channel faster. So the thing is the transition for a lot of people would actually be better from full-time job to full-time freelancer to full-time creator. And when you don't have the manpower, and again, if you have money, you can buy the manpower. So if you have money, you can buy the manpower by hiring a thumbnail designer. You can buy the manpower by hiring a video editor. Um, you can um, hire a graphic designer or an animator. You can do those things. So that can be, um, so money gets you the manpower. If not, you network with other people in your local community. You might be creators. You trade favors with each other. If you provide manpower to somebody else once in a while, you can ask for that favor in return. So um, that's what would make the difference. Abaddon, what's up? Friend from Coffee Talk. Yeah, the people who request super specific stuff, put that in your membership for your channel membership and make those videos for channel members. And that's an incentive for the people asking for super specific stuff. Make that for them, for super specific stuff. For super specific stuff, sometimes maybe even try doing that super, super specific thing and seeing if it pops off in shorts. Because if you did it as a short, no harm, no foul. So consider that. Um, that's what I would look at. And like I said, for the when your audience requests super specific stuff, put it in your membership and then see who really cares about it. They'll show up and they'll pay and that's a good way to do it. Or try and see and test it as a short, see if it pops off as a short. Yep, make notes. Uh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh figuring out how I'm gonna make a book. I'm going to like, not another book book. I'm writing another book book. Um, I'm writing another book book, but I'm going to make a workbook. I'm going to make a creator workbook. And that creator workbook is going to have a thing. It's going to teach you how to build your audience avatar. The workbook is going to have a thing for us to write down our content pillars. It's going to have a thing for us to write down our individual video ideas. It's going to do a thing to do, help us do our market fit, do our abilities plus market fit. It's going to like, I'm going to break all this down and we're going to end up making a workbook and then I'm going to make the workbook and I'm going to post it on Amazon. And the workbook is the thing that I think everyone will and should buy. And then you can use the workbook during uh, streams and lessons from me, uh, conferences in person, or even literally on your own. And it will be valuable. So I'm going to start sketching out the designs for the, um, you know, uh, creator workbook. Um, Iman says, should I keep creating content despite no one watching it? I mean, if you've made 20 videos about something you're passionate about and no one watches it, then feel like oh, I've, I've made these videos. I was passionate about them. I put them out there and it, like, it looked like no one cared, but at least I made them now move on and make something where there is demand and there's proof that people want to watch it. Also people not wanting to watch something is usually a packaging issue. It's usually I picked the topic that nobody cared about, or I made a thumbnail that no one would be attracted to, or I communicated a title poorly. So let's think about this. Think about this. If you were to walk out of your house and you go to a place and nobody's there, there's no chance of you making friends or attracting a date. It's not possible because the bar is empty. The place is dead. Okay. Or you go to a place that's popping and then you try to have a conversation in a place that's popping 
about stuff that nobody seems to care about, you're a bad communicator. So that's your titles. That's a title problem, right? That's a, oh, I found a place that's popping. That's the market. That's the niche. I found a niche. I found a topic that's popping and where people care and like where people are. And then, oh, I open my mouth. I talk about stuff no one has heard of, no one cares about, no one's interested in. And now I'm a weirdo and a freak and nobody likes me. So now you screwed it up. I went to a place and now I opened my mouth and nobody cares. So that's a title problem. So the thing is, the problem for people is either their topic, aka they pick the wrong market, nobody's there, or if they pick the right market, they show up and they say nonsense and nobody cares and everyone looks at them weird and no one wants to date them and no one wants to dance with them and no one wants to buy them a drink. Okay? Or you show up and you look like a bum <laughs> or you look like a weirdo or you look like a freak and then the market's like, ugh. Like, uh, they're like, get the hell out of here. I'll avoid you. Like, run away on site. Retreat on site. Out of here. Gone. Nope. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Nope. Curb. Uh, nope. Uh, swipe left. Yeah. So literally, you need to think of it in these terms because all we're doing, all we're doing is we're trying to attract an audience. We have to go where people are. Then we have to be attractive. And then we have to communicate properly. That's how you make friends and influence in people. That's how you build relationships out of thin air. You go where people are, you have to be attractive and present yourself well, then you have to communicate well and be interesting. If we're not getting views, it means we're failing to do that. Now, here's the thing. I will do videos that will get 10,000 views and videos that get 100,000 views. And you know what the difference is? Most of the time, the difference is how big is the market, not how big is my audience subscriber count. doesn't matter how many people care about that thing that I'm talking about. How many people care about that thing? That is literally how many people care about this microphone versus how many people care about Power Rangers? How many people care about this microphone versus how many people care about Star Wars? I guarantee you more people care about Star Wars. That's the difference. Total addressable market decides views. So that's the starting point. You cannot get something bigger than the market. You cannot get more views than exist in the market for that attention. Then you cannot exceed the views that you can personally attract at a glance. Being attractive at a glance is called a thumbnail. So even if there's a bunch of people here, you can only be attractive to so many of them. And that depends on you knowing what you're supposed to look like to be attractive to the people you want to attract. That is what a thumbnail is. That is what design is. That is what photography is. That is what aesthetic is. So you do that. Then you have to still communicate well. And a lot of people, you can be attractive, you can be in the right market, and then you open your mouth and you ruin it all. And that's what a bad title is. And then for retention, that's the same thing as opening your mouth. It's that I gave you a chance and now you screwed it up in the first 30 seconds. You said the wrong thing. I'm no longer interested. I'm no longer attracted to you. You're not interesting. You look good, but you're a lame. Out. So that's the, yeah, that's the thing. So that's where people are screwing up. If you were wondering, why don't I get views? I've literally answered it. It's like, if if any situation, those are the things that are going on. In any given situation, those are things going on. And sometimes it's a matter of timing, by the way. Oh, hey, I heard this place was popping. Well, you showed up at the wrong time. Everyone's left already. Or hey, you're too early. You can be too early. You can be too late. You have to be just right. Um, yeah, for how much money? Yeah, for like, it depends on how much you need to live. I mean, it depends on how much you need to live. Yeah, do you go full time based upon the earnings or should you take some risk and burn some boats? I do not believe. All right. So the majority of people are working class creators. I think taking some rich and burning some boats is for people who have privilege or who are desperate. I don't like the desperate thing, but I think it's for people who have privilege. I'm all about the slow burn, the slow grind, risk minimization, because most of your working class creators, you work 40 hours a week, you're barely making ends meet, you live paycheck to paycheck, you're working 40 hours a week, you only have 10 to 20 hours to make content a week, you don't have a lot of money to invest, that's where you're at. That's a working class creator. That's 60% of the audience is working class creators. Then you have career driven creators who are making some money from their content, but not quite enough to quit their job yet, or they're about to quit their job, or they just quit their job. So they're in that weird transition. They're in that weird place where it's like they can go full time, but they need things to work out just right here or there. So they're about to go full time, or they have gone full time, 
and they're right there. Then you have established graders who have been full time for a year or longer. You have, and that's uh, only 10% of the audience. So 60% of the audience is the working class creator. 30% of the audience can be the career creator. 10% uh, of the audience is the established creator. So the um, that's the breakdown of my audience, right? That's the avatar. Most of y'all have no business going all in on YouTube and risking it all. And it's going to mess you up your life. And like going all in, there's two people who can probably go all in. People whose money is already good because they're in their 30s or 40s. They've established they made their money. They paid their mortgage. They have zero debt. They can take a risk or they have a successful business that can run on autopilot and they can take risk. So that's usually creators that are in their late 30s, early 40s that are established in life. And now they can be rookie content creators and they can take some risk and burn some boats. The other group of people who can take risk and burn boats are kids who, if they screw up their life, between the ages of 16 and 22, they're probably gonna be okay and can still start over and be okay. Or who come from privilege and their parents can let them drop out of college and try YouTube for two years. That's where a lot of these successful creators came from. It's just kids whose parents let them drop out of uh, college and try their heart out for two years. And because they had unlimited time to do that, maybe mommy and daddy flowed them a little check here or there, they were able to do it. Or it's kids that were dead broke and desperate but if you're broke, desperate, and you can live off of ramen and you're healthy at 20 or 18, you can take some risk. You can burn some boats because if you screw up your life, even if you're not going quite back to mommy and dad in the suburbs, you're probably not going to be homeless. And you can probably pick yourself up and start again because you, you're only a kid. And you can start over and there's always a regular ass job waiting for you. Sorry about the cursing there. It's just a regular job waiting for you. So that's the reality of who gets to do that. The majority of people who have responsibilities, they have kids. They're married, cannot do this. They cannot go all in. They cannot just up and do it. They have to do it the slow way, the hard way, and they don't get to pop off overnight most of the time, and that's how it is. The kids who get to go all in, take risks, look foolish, go viral, it's because they're kids. And if they screw up, they get to start life all over again and live a decent outcome and just you know be mediocre or even slightly above average, and it's fine. Or it's people who come from privilege, and so screwing up, not going to be a bad outcome. They're going to have a good life no matter what. Now, instead of a regular job, they're going to go work for mommy and daddy. They're going to work for daddy's friend from the country club. So they get to try their little heart out. Because if it doesn't work out, they're still going to have a better life than most people. And I'm just being blunt, and that's the cold, harsh truth of it. Again, look at the most successful people on YouTube. Look really hard at that. Now tell me that's someone who, if they screwed up, they were going to be homeless. You can't. So just think about that for a second. So, no, most of y'all watching this, you have no business burning any boats. That's just a cold, harsh truth. That's cold and ugly as it sounds. That's the truth. <laughs> now, what I would do, like I told you, my big thing is I think for a lot of you, if you go the route of, can I use my skills to make more money faster than I can giving 40 hours a week to the job? Like what I found out is that by doing freelancing, I could get 500 or $1,000 gigs. I lived in North Carolina. This is like 12 years ago, wherever. I lived in North Carolina. Rent was 960 for a three bedroom house. You know, So if I made like $1,500, it's rent and utilities but not food, gas, and car note. So like my thing is I had to make like, you know, two grand. I had to make like two grand, okay? So since I had to make two grand, you know, 2,500 to be comfortable, and I was healthy and young, like I was like 28, like two grand, 2,500, I figured out that by doing client work, I could make 500 to $1,000 a gig with um, not that much effort in terms of time, effort in terms of skill, but not time. So I knew I could make 500 to $1,000 a gig. I can make 500 to $1,000 on a weekend shooting a wedding. I could do a website for somebody and capture half up front. Um, I could do a logo design, capture half up front. So I'm like, oh, as long as I can get a logo design client, a website client, a wedding client, as long as I get two clients a month, I can cover my bills. If I get two to three clients, maybe four tops, I can cover my bills. Then I could cash flow. I was like, oh, I can get more than I need to cover my bills because if I do some smaller gigs, some flyers here or there, 
oh, I do a little thing here or there. I was also able to do trade show stuff because I could do print stuff and I could do book covers. So again, I could get $500 gigs, $200 gigs, cash up front, half up front, whatever, and I could do these. And I can knock these things out in a couple of hours. I could like do it in a day or turn around stuff in 42, 72 hours. Some of my clients want stuff in 42, 72 hours, two or three day turnarounds, and I'd have it for them, boom, two or three days. So like, I could literally make the money that I needed to make for a month. I could make it in a week or two weeks and not have to give up 40 hours of my time a week to do it, which left me a lot of time, flexibility, and energy for content creation. I was capturing money up front. And so I was having cash flow, some money up front. And I also did small online gigs, small online gigs that I found that could take me 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and I make $50, I'd do it. So I was sitting there, I was like, oh wow, I can make $150 a day, fantastic. So I set a goal, I was like, I can make $150 a day. If I came up short some days, it's 30 days a week. So I started making a couple thousand dollars a month. I was making more money with less time and less energy and less frustration, but it was all on me, it was all on me. There was no reliable, steady paycheck. Not until I got clients who were like, hey Roberto, we need you to write these freelance articles for you. We're gonna give you like two or three articles um, a month. How does $100, $150 an article sound? Fantastic. You want uh, three articles a month, $150? Great. That's $450. Wow. That's half the rent. I don't have to worry about. Then I was like, oh, there's other publications. Hey, do you want to write for a sister publication? Hey, I recommended you to a friend at another publication. So I had writing clients. So I was a copywriter and I was writing articles for um, How Design Magazine, Print Magazine, Creative Pro, um, you know, a couple of other like photography magazines here or there. Um, you know, so. I did some Photoshop magazines. So I was writing this um, stuff and I was like, oh, I have enough writing clients to make a thousand dollars a month. I can pay rent from that. And I was doing Amazon affiliate. I was making a thousand dollars a month from Amazon affiliate. I was like, oh, that's fantastic. AdSense was only making $300 a month. I was a small YouTuber. AdSense wasn't paying rent. AdSense was paying car note, but not rent. So like, okay, Amazon pays rent or writing clients pays rent. Oh, I got a wedding gig, extra money, yay. So I was like doing this, oh, logo design client, fantastic. And so I was doing that. And then it was still leaving me time to make content. So I was able to figure out, oh, I don't need to work 40 hours a week to make the same amount of money I need. But why? Because I lived in North Carolina and it was cheap. I lived in North Carolina and it was cheap. That's why that worked. So if you can make money without working 40 hours a week and make the same money, and it takes you less time, then you end up with extra time for content creation. So then that meant that I was like, okay, I could do this, do that. So some weeks I was working 60 hours a week, some weeks I was working 10, 20 hours a week. So I was doing this flex time thing. If I was in a crunch for client stuff and I still wanna make content, I had to work for 60 hours. But there were weeks where I only had to work 10 or 20 and to get the same outcome. So for a while, that's what I did. And even when I hit 100,000 subscribers, I wasn't able to live off of any AdSense money because I was also in a multi -con a network contract with a multi-channel network that was taking 50% of my AdSense. And at the time, this is the olden days of YouTube, AdSense was not that good back then. It just really wasn't. So um, it took me a while before I was ever making $1,000 off AdSense. I was making $1,000 off the Amazon Influencer Program. Then slowly but surely, once in a while, I was starting to get brand deals. And I would get a, you know, oh, wow, review this laptop. Well, actually not review this laptop because I didn't do reviews. I would do a showcase of the laptop. I'd do the review after the contract is over because I'd only do 30-day reviews. I told them I only do 30-day reviews. So the thing is the contract will expire after 30 days, so I won't be under contract because I'm not going to do a contracted review. I'll still have the product. I still want views. So I'll do a review, but I only do 30-day reviews or 90-day reviews or one-year reviews. So I said, okay, fine. Uh, so I did my product showcase video. So they sent me a laptop. I do five best features for a laptop. I did this for Dell, I did this for HP. Um, so five best features for the laptop. Hey, uh, best features for this laptop for graphic designers, best features for this laptop for video editors. So I do product showcase, sponsored by whatever. Oh, they sent me the product, blah, blah, blah. I'm just telling you the best features and how I use it and showing you the, what, the benchmarks. So that's how I did it. Then I do a 30 day review after I already had the thing and used it for 30 days. Okay, I've used this for 30 days. I'm no longer sponsored. I can tell you what I think. Here's how I'm using it. So I would do that. So boom, boom, boom. I started getting brand deals. Um, then in the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, I started doing Awesome Creator Academy. I've been doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching, doing some paid speaking engagements, doing some paid workshops. So then I was getting, I fired all my freelance clients and I went to working with uh, consulting companies and coaching creators. So I started consulting companies, 
coaching creators. I, I fired all of my freelance clients in terms of uh, photography, design, photo editing, video editing. I fired all my video editing clients. Um, still wrote for publications until uh, publications um, stopped doing that. Then I started writing my more of my own content for myself. And so then started doing that. Now I write the newsletter stuff for myself. I would write for a publication, again, if they wanted me to be a contributing writer. But at this point, if I was going to be a contributing writer, I would want to do entrepreneur.com, Forbes, that sort of thing. Maybe I reach out to some of my contacts. I could do that. So um, then I wouldn't worry about doing it paid. I'd do it for uh, reputation purposes and for networking and influence. So you move to a cheap place. I live in Georgia now, by the way. I live in Georgia now. So North Carolina, Georgia, cheap enough place to live, lower cost of living, still not great cost of living with the current economy, but it makes things work. So then I made it practical and affordable based off of you know what I needed to do. So not living in California, New York is also how you become a full-time content creator. You want to be a full-time content creator? Don't live in California. That's the real answer. The real hack, if you want to be a full-time content creator, don't live in California. <laughs> Not joking, not joking. There are a lot of YouTubers today, OG YouTubers, who didn't get to buy a house because they moved to California. If they just stayed in their small town and just flown out for collabs, their life would have been better. If they'd moved to Florida instead of to California, they would have been able to buy a house and their life would have been better. Uh, I did answer this question. I do not believe it affects monetization at all. Um, Lenitas Johnson says, this is a good question. Lenita Johnson says, it looks like you did Amazon prior to most of us knowing about the affiliate program. Do you see any other money-making potential for anything on the horizon that many of us don't know about right now? Podcasting and live streaming is the ultimate monetization hack. The ultimate monetization hack is live streaming and podcasting. And most of y'all don't realize it. The other big thing that a lot of you are sleeping on that I teach is user-generated content, UGC. UGC plays and NIL plays are highly underrated and no one talks about it in creator monetization. And I'm one of the only ones who talks about it. I'm one of the only ones who teaches it. It's a different thought process and approach to brand deals without having to make your platform as big as possible and still make money off of reputation, representation, um, and the quality that you do in production and editing, or also your appearance to some degree, if you're the right look for a brand as a spokesperson or a model. So a lot of you could be models and spokespersons for brands on their platform and their social. A lot of you could be managers on their social. A lot of you could be producers or editors on their socials and you'd make money as a UGC creator. And a lot of you don't know that, or if you're the right representation, it's a name image likeness and you license that out and you do that in six and 12 month contracts and a lot of you don't know that. So the big things that monetization wise that y'all don't know about that I know about that I'm doing are a lot of you do not know about uh, product development and memberships the right way to monetize that the most. And a lot of you are only just splitting your revenue with platforms as digital sharecroppers. So I know about the importance of membership subscriptions that you own and not with Patreon with your own website and how to make that work. I know that angle. I also know how to do it with the platforms, but again, still be a digital sharecropper if you do it that way. I know about UGC and NIL, which most of you don't know about. And I know about the value of monetizing podcasts and the value of monetizing newsletters. And newsletters and podcast monetization are underrated. No one talks about it because most people want to be entertainers. They don't think about it. There's ways as an entertainer to do an entertainment-based podcast and you can make money. There's still ways as an entertainer to make a newsletter. Then you get sponsors for the newsletter and you make money doing that. And then a lot of you still don't understand product development around your audience and niche. I teach that and that's something else I look at. So there's about like five really good plays that most of the market's not talking about. And even the creators doing it, they're not sharing it with you. Um, maybe they don't want the competition. Maybe they don't feel educated enough to educate other people about it. And they're like, hey, I just, I know how to do it for me. I couldn't tell you how to do it for you is how many of them feel. I work with people specifically around these things. So those are the things I'm seeing peeking around corners that most people aren't looking at because it's not obvious to say, let me just go work for the brand on their social media. That's not obvious to people. Even people who decide they want quick content creation or they get hacked or something goes wrong, they go, oh, well, my backup plan is I'm going to rely on my degree. No, genius. Go make six figures. Go be the marketing manager at one of the companies that you did sponsorship with in the past and take over the job role of somebody that's a, a partner manager, brand integrations, influencer marketing specialist at a company. 
go be an independent contractor and work for multiple companies that you did brand deals with and work with them as a consultant and don't even make content anymore. Be a consultant that knows the audience, knows the brand that they did brand deals with, help them negotiate influencer contracts, help them build an affiliate program, do all of that. Then use those contacts in the industry. Maybe you start a creator management company and you manage all of your old collaborators and competitors and you now use the network to connect them with the brands. And now you have an agency that can connect brands and creators, creators and brands. You take both money from both sides and now that's your deal and that's your exit strategy. Oh, I don't want to make content anymore. Anymore. I guess I'm going to, I still need to make money though. I guess I'm going to fall back on my degree. No genius. You are a beauty influencer. You have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. It's like, no, you go and you work as a consultant for the brands. Then you also then can mentor other creators up and coming and you could either do mentorship or you don't want to do that. Do management for them, help them build their brand and manage them. Take a percentage of brand deals. You bring them from those relationships, consult with the brands, charge on both sides. Duh. Like, but I'm a business guy. That's why. <laughs> Like I'm better at business than I am at getting views. Like for me, for my channel, I can get views for other people. That's the whole point of clients. But like my niche also has a smaller total addressable market for now, for now. But again, um, you know, this is what I do. Yeah. So again, I would say that underrated things people are not looking at is how to go deeper on some of these relationships. Yep. Reinvest in yourself. Um, who to follow, uh, follow me, Nathan Barry, Noah Kagan, Daniel Batal, um, Ed from film booth. <sighs> Justin Moore, Creator Wizard, Jay Klaus, Creator Science, um, Nick Nimmin, uh, Nate Black. Yeah, that that's like a decent list. It's a good place to start. Yep. All right, everybody. I think that's it for tonight. Um, I've consumed all of my fluids, apparently. Um, Fazu, with that one, you just have to work out the details. There's ways to do it ethically. There's like people do this all the time. There's ways to do it properly. So I wouldn't worry about it. <clears throat> like I said, anyway, great stream. You guys really appreciate you. Like I said, um, make sure you're checking out awesomecreatoracademy.com. Uh, one of the main products that I think would help a lot of you um, is either the AI creator prompts or the creator starter pack. But we also have creator blueprints and these are some great startup pdf guides to give you frameworks and systems as a content creator so these are the systems for success that you actually need so we have that you could think of these almost like uh how andrew huberman does the protocols so you can think of these as creator protocols so here's the creator blueprints product i'm going to leave that here for you in the chat so you can take a peek at that um if you want to see a uh what that looks like um we've got hang on we got that here so when you go to the landing page for creator blueprints you'll see your boy here and it explains what you're going to get in terms of some of these frameworks so we have that uh we also have um the creator prompts creator prompts so uh, with the AI creator prompts, we have um, these advanced creator prompts for ChatGPT4. We have some regular ones you can use for ChatGPT. And these are productivity hacks for creators with AI. And I think when you go to check out, we actually give you um, a couple of prompts that you could even try out when you go to check out. So that's kind of cool. So we give you some value up front there. And we also have the creator uh, starter pack. And these are just some thumbnail templates uh, that you can use anything that opens Photoshop. So that includes photop.com and that includes 
Adobe Express can open Photoshop files. That's uh, nine bucks and you get that. Plus you get a media kit to pitch brands. It's a two page media kit. Uh, we have some bigger products, but these are the cheapest products you can buy if you want to support me and also get great value for only nine dollars. Um, that is a way that you can do that. So, yep. Uh, Dan AI says, did I see the drama with Nate Black? Uh, no, I didn't see any drama with him, uh, but I can always reach out to him and find out if anything's going on. I can always text him, but no, I haven't seen any drama. I don't really care for drama. Uh, so if I want to know what's going on with someone, I just text them or DM them. So, so no, uh, yep. Don't know about any drama. Don't really care for it. <laughs> I'm a business guy. Uh, so yeah, so those are just some of our great products. Uh, if you want free value, like I said, free value, grab the 12 week creator playbook is linked in the description. And um, it's also probably going to be the pinned comment. No, the pinned comment will be the timestamps. Whoever does the timestamps will do that. So yep, yeah, that's the value. We're going to close out the stream, of course, as per usual with the, um, also, we'll say a quick thank you to our sponsors, StreamYard, Opus Clip, and Kajabi. Links are in the description. And so, yeah, the thing we'll close out with is we will close out the stream, aside from saying thank you, with the trailer for my book. And you can get that on Amazon and everywhere else. So let's uh, let me find that trailer. Yeah, we'll do the trailer for my book, and we'll say goodnight. Stay awesome. Bye. I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October, 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like. Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today. Take care.